and today we start a play by R.D. Wingfield, Better Never Than Late. Over a long career as a police detective, Inspector Chu has had his share of successes, but one big failure is what sticks in his craw. And when, on the eve of his retirement, there's a reason to reopen the investigation, well, it's a chance that he just won't let slip by. But by this time, Inspector Chu has become a jaded and embittered sour old man. Nobody's favorite copper, not even his colleagues. Leslie Sands stars in Better Never Than Late. Yes? Uh, sorry to bother you, sir. Shut that door, man. I've only just got the place warm. Pity the chap's on the beat on a day like this, eh? Oh, yes, sir. There's a lot to be said for administration department in the winter. Right now, you want to see me? What's that ominous-looking piece of paper in your hand? Not more work for me, I hope. Oh, no, sir. We're collecting for Inspector Chew's retirement present, and we thought you'd like to contribute. Who got this up? I did, sir. I wish you'd ask me first, Sergeant Rushton. Sir? You put me in a damned embarrassing position. The senior officers and myself have had our own whip round. Just the senior officer, sir? Uh, yes. That's not usual, sir. I know it's not usual, Sergeant. The situation itself is not usual. We didn't think anyone else would bother, particularly the other ranks. Inspector Chew's not exactly popular, is he? Well, neither, sir, was Superintendent Bailey nor Inspector Harrington, but all ranks were expected to chip in for them. Come now, Rushton, they were hardly in the same category as Inspector Chew, were they? Did I hear my name mentioned? Ah, Chu. Come in, come in. Talk of the devil, eh, Sergeant? Uh, we were just saying, uh, next week then, is it? Happily counting the days, here the end of next week. Much to everyone's delight, no doubt. We'll discuss the other matter later, then, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Sergeant? Sir? How's my collection doing? Well, don't blush, man. I've got eyes. Finding it hard going, are you? Oh, it's coming along quite well, sir. Right, chap. He'll go far. Yeah. Once he gets rid of the idea that you can succeed in the force through hard work and dedication to duty, you probably intended to ask me to sit down. I know it's a bit late in the day to offer you advice, Chu, but if only you had tried to be just a little more pleasant to people who matter, you might have been retiring with a much higher rank. I'll leave the creep into others, thank you. What do you want to see me about? The, uh, the old man has asked me to have a few words with you. Uh, strictly off the record, of course. You mean he hasn't got the guts to bawl me out himself? The chief training officer has made another complaint about you. Not surprised. Seems to prefer complaining to training these days. Some of your more outspoken and cynical comments are felt to be utterly out of place when made to CID trainees. You'll be shot of me in a week. Can't ruin too many budding detectives in that short time. You've a lecture today. Which I shall be late for if you keep me much longer. Very well. As you say, there's not much point now. What's your subject? The Waverton kidnapping. Oh. Uh -huh. Is that wise? You can learn more from a failure than you can from a success. Yes, but had it been me... Yeah? Oh, it doesn't matter. Pity you won't be meeting your successor, this new chap from Southwest Division. Understand he's a first-class bridge player. The old man's tickled pink. Wonderful. I was afraid for a moment he'd be a good policeman and be completely out of place. Some people would take that remark seriously, Chu. No one takes me seriously. I won't keep you. I've got to make arrangements for the interdepartmental bridge tournament tonight. The public don't realise just how much is involved in fighting crime, do they? Well, mustn't keep the class waiting. Little rascals get up to all kinds of mischief when teacher's late. All right, gentlemen, thank you. Simmer down. Play time's over. My name is Chew, Inspector Chew. You may call me sir. <laughs> so you want to be detectives, and you'd all better listen to me, particularly that one at the back, the fat one. I'm over here, son, not out the window. I've forgotten more about detection than you'll ever know, so listen to the pearls of wisdom I'm about to place before you. What do you want? Uh, may I ask a question, sir? Collins, isn't it? Uh, yes, sir. Very well, Collins, if you must. Are you the same Inspector Chew who caught the Hammersmith Bullion Gang in the 50s, sir? What if I am? Um, it was mentioned in a previous lecture, sir, as a classic example of the intelligent use of standard police techniques. Do you play bridge, Collins? 
Uh, no, sir. Take it up. You'll go far in this division. <laughs> yes, that was one of mine. A long time ago, wasn't it, sir? Yeah, a long time ago. Uh, tell us about it, Inspector. You've already had a lecture on that, haven't you? Any fool can talk about his successes. It takes a special kind of fool to talk about his failures, and I'm going to tell you about an all-time flop. Any of you remember the Waverton kidnapping case? It was never solved, was it, sir? Top marks, Burton. Um, wasn't it bodged up or something, sir? You better be a good bridge player, Collins. Yes, it was bodged up. It was one of my cases, the last one, in fact. They wouldn't let me handle any more after that, so don't let anyone tell you our superiors lack common sense. It only appears that way. <laughs> now, none of you young gentlemen are afraid of the dark, I hope, because we're having the lights out. Just let me switch the projector on. All right, Collins. Where's the girl with the ices? <laughs> <laughs> I'm the only comedian here, thank you, Smith. Now look at the screen. That is an aerial view of the village of Waverton Magna in Norfolk, taken some 12 years ago. The white you can see everywhere is snow, and the cluster of black specks is one of the search parties organised to look for a missing baby. One of the more handsome black dots is me. <laughs> now, apart from bodged-up cases, what else is Waverton Magna famous for? There's a brewery there, sir. Thank you, Smith. You look the sort of chap who'd have known that one. <laughs> yes, the Cresswell Brewery, owned by one of the richest families in Europe. In addition to the brewery, they have extensive cattle ranching interests in South America, sheep farms in Australia, a development company in Mayfair, and a shipping line now oh, somewhere or other. Which adds up to them not being short of a few bobs, sir. Quite. The brewery is a little way outside the village, surrounded by an estate for the workers. <coughs> now, the villagers are a different breed entirely. It seems to be the tradition for them to work as house servants and estate workers for the Cresswell family. Ah, that big house there, that's the Cresswell home. Ah, that's a few years old, sir. 16th century, I think, but the Cresswells didn't move into it until the 1920s, during the Great Depression. The previous squire had been wiped out in the financial crash. It had been damn tough for the villagers if Cresswell hadn't found them all work. Most of the villagers today weren't even born then, but they still regard Cresswell as some kind of saint. That's not the present Cresswell, is it, sir? Good Lord, no. Old Cresswell died some 20 years ago. His son inherited the old man's reputation and his money. He doesn't deserve either. Typical stuck-up rich man's son, a type I loathe. Uh, is your father rich, Collins? Uh, no, sir. Ah. Well, let's get on. The victim, a male child, aged 11 months. There he is with his sister, Sarah. She was about seven or eight at the time. A lovely-looking kid, sir. Yeah. Now on to the next. Oh, 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 oh. What a cracker. Now that's the mother, Pamela Fulton. And I agree with your coarse comments, gentlemen. She was strikingly beautiful. That uh, come-hither smile. <laughs> I never saw her smile. Saw her cry. So I told her not to worry that I'd get her baby back. Lesson number one... Just because a woman's tragically appealing, don't make damn fool promises you won't be able to keep. In fact, rule number one should read, never promise anything. <laughs> now, don't get all maudlin, gentlemen. This was 12 years ago. She'd be nearly 40 now, and I probably remember more about her son than she does. Ah, this is the note left by the kidnappers. Uh, would you read it, Collins, both for me and for the benefit of your less educated colleagues? If you do what I tell you to do, the baby will be all right. Beautifully read. Any comments? No mention of any <coughs> ransom money, sir. Good, good. Anyone want to add anything to that? It's a typical first note, sir. The actual demand for money usually follows. Top of the class, Collins. Now, what about the note itself? The handwriting, the spelling? Well, the handwriting's bad enough to be disguised and the spelling bad enough to be deliberate. That was the conclusion I reached. Where was the note found, sir? On the cot. Now, wait a minute, it's in the next slide. There. That's the nursery, exactly as we found it. You can see the note on the cot. Notice how the bedclothes are carefully pulled back. That would suggest a woman, sir. Or a man. Well, that's narrowed down our field of suspects, hasn't it? <laughs> There's no sign of forced entry. It wasn't necessary. They never lock their doors in those parts. People just walk in and out of each other's homes. Charming custom for the law-abiding... But if the Boston Strangler had emigrated to Waverton, he'd have had a field day. There was something peculiar about the weather, wasn't there, sir? Uh, the snow? The snow, yeah. 
They'd had the granddaddy of all snowstorms that day. Until they'd got the snowplows through, the village was completely cut off. All roads were impassable. They had to fly me in by helicopter. The beauty of this arrangement, gentlemen, as those of you still awake will have realised, is that the kidnappers and the baby couldn't get very far. They had to be in or near the village. They couldn't get out. That made it easy for you, sir? Made it damned embarrassing when I failed to find anything. Who did the searching? We had the lot. Uniformed and plainclothes police, civilian helpers. Give Cresswell his due. He released men from the brewery on full pay to help us. We searched right through the night with torches, then through most of the following day. We found nothing. But you said the baby and the kidnappers must have been in the village. That's right. I suppose it was a thorough search, sir. If you've got nothing sensible to say, Smith, keep your mouth shut. We were out in that crippling weather for five days and nights, all told. Some of us were lucky to get eight hours sleep in all that time. We searched. And for Smith's benefit, I will say thoroughly searched. Every house, hut, cottage, shed, barn, outhouse, pigsty, chicken roost. In fact, every single building within a radius of two miles. We crawled over every inch of ground. We examined every pit, copse or wood where a child's body could conceivably be hidden. Not only did we drag every pond, we minutely examined the contents of every cesspool. Detective works not without its glamorous side, you'll notice. <laughs> when we'd finished, we turned and went over the same ground again and again. So in answer to your question, Smith, yes, it was a thorough search. Sorry, sir. Now, don't spoil it by being sorry, son. Never accept what you've been told. Always check and double check. Part of a policeman's lot to be hated, so don't you worry about causing offence. So he could still be alive today, couldn't he, sir? In so far as we never found a body, yes. Now, there's a couple more slides. Ah, the boy's father. Oh, dear. I'm going to have to upset you, Smith. That's the millionaire brewer, the lord of the manor, Moneybags Cresswell. Now, wait a minute. That's the husband. I didn't say he was the husband, sir. I said he was the father. Not necessarily the same thing. You shock me, Smith. Why do you say he's the father? Can we have the baby's photograph again? For you, Smith, anything. Now, push the one of Creswell alongside. I'll try. Uh, there. Well, you can see the resemblance. The ears, the, the line of the nose. Oh, he's right, sir. Dirty old devil. <laughs> You, uh, you had noticed the resemblance, of course, sir. No, Smith, I hadn't. I should have thought it was obvious. Can a broken-down old failure give you a piece of advice, son? If, in your smug way, you spot something your superior has missed, don't rub his nose in it. Antagonise the public if you like, but not the bloke who has a say in your promotion prospects. I was a fool not to have seen it. Explains all the help he gave us. His anxiety... <laughs> it explains a lot. Ah, oh, put the lights on, somebody. For your infernal cheek, Smith, you can give me a cigarette. I don't smoke, sir. And I don't like you, Smith. Uh, here you are, sir. Oh, thank you, Collins. Right, gentlemen. We have five minutes. Just time for you to solve the Fulton baby kidnapping for me. Oh, come on. Uh, Smith, you're our great white hope. You've got two minutes to wrap it up. Why don't you tell us what you did, sir? I did everything in the book. House to house searching, statements from every man, woman and child. It's in your standing instructions. Read it. I did it all. This time, just didn't work. Can I be frank, sir? No, Smith. Enough people were frank with me at the time. I was told that either I wasn't thorough enough or I had missed something obvious. And they were wrong, of course, sir. I'll tell you the best way you can get on in the force, Smith. Keep your mouth shut. Ah, oh, go on. Go and have your coffee break. Session's over. Right, thank you, sir. Indeed, sir. Oh, come on, to this canton. Oh, Inspector. Sent your chums out to play, Sergeant. Yeah, a letter for you, sir. Ta. Uh, from a security firm I went to see last week. Last. Did you get the job, sir? Don't be such a damn fool, Sergeant. Just a polite inquiry, sir? That only works with polite people, Sergeant. No, I did not get the job. I imagine my interview with their chairman proved my downfall. I see, sir. Waverton Magna? Hmm? 
You've got it written on the board, sir. That's right. Yeah. I've seen that name somewhere else. Oh, yeah? Got it. It was in the latest digest of reports. There's a copy on your desk. I don't bother to read them anymore. Yeah, apparently they were excavating for the new Norwich bypass when they found a skeleton just outside the village. What's that? The skeleton of a young child, sir. The chief superintendent will see you now, Inspector. Thank you. Go straight in. Ah, uh, true. You wanted to see me? Yes, sir, I did. Yeah, you made a right mess of your interview for that security job, didn't you? I've got a charming letter here from their chairman thanking me for recommending you. You haven't got the job, you know that? Yes, sir. They kindly wrote to tell me. If you didn't want it, you could at least have declined it politely. I'm sorry, sir. He got under my skin. Oh, and I strongly recommended you. Oh, sit down, man. Sit down. You're a fool, too. A stupid fool. At one time, I foresaw a brilliant career for you, and what happened? You just let some silly domestic upset ruin everything. Silly domestic? My son died and my wife walked out on me. And you've had 12 years to get over it. My private life is none of your concerns. Oh, no, damn well it is. Anyway, that's all in the past. What are you going to do when you retire? Do you care? What did you want to see me about, Inspector? They found the skeleton of a child just outside Waverton Magna. It was in yesterday's digestive reports. Yes, I've got it here. So? Waverton Magna was the scene of my kidnapping case. Yes, too, I know. The body was never found. This could be it. Hmm. And they've taken it to the central lab for tests. Yes, I found them. The tests won't be completed until sometime tomorrow. It infers here that the skeleton had been buried for some time. The kidnapping was 12 years ago. Uh... I'd like to go down to Waverton, sir. If this is the missing kid, it would be the only positive lead I've had. Oh, I'm sorry, Chu. It's out of the question. Why? Do I have to spell it out to you? Yes, sir. Spell it out. Twelve years ago, you were a good policeman. For the past twelve years, you've been a damn bad one. It was my case, sir, and I'm entitled to see it through. I can demand that you let me go. Demand? You're in no position to demand anything. Now, how can I let you go? It's outside our territory. We haven't been called in. A phone call to the chief constable down there at Square. It could be semi-unofficial, but I'd report to him if I found anything. Twelve years ago, I wouldn't have hesitated. Oh, all right. Get down there today. I'll get the lab to phone the results direct to you in Waverton. Yes, sir. Um, thank you. <laughs> Don't strain yourself. It's just that I think you'll do less harm down there than you would here. I get enough complaints from the training officer as it is. Where will we get hold of you? I'll stay at the Cresswell Arms, Waverton Magna. Oh, one other thing, sir. Yes? I'd like to take Sergeant Rushton with me. The experience will do him good. Oh, very well, if you want to. Stop! Oh, sorry to keep you waiting, sir. I... Uh... Good Lord. A ghost from the past to haunt you, Sam. Inspector Chew. Why, this is a surprise. Well, I sent you a telegram. Booking two single rooms. When was this? About lunchtime. Oh, today? Well, I expect we'll get it tomorrow. The boy'd have to cycle in from Linsett St Paul's, you see, and... It's pouring with rain. If he waits till tomorrow, he can come by bus. He'll have the choice of two. Just for the weekend, is it? We well, might be staying longer. This is my assistant, Sergeant Rushton. Sergeant, Sam Fletcher, our landlord. Oh, pleased to meet you, Sam. How do you do? You've put a bit of weight on, Sam. You haven't changed much, sir. I feel about 100 years old. Still a policeman, then? They didn't sack me, if that's what you mean. Oh, you did your best, sir, and it was a long time ago. Down here for holiday? No. Oh, Business, Sam. You should have been in the force, Sam. You're so quick. Look, do you think we could go up to our rooms? We're soaked to the skin and my sergeant has a weak chest. It uh, is your chest that's weak, isn't it, sergeant? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, sir, keeping you talking. Uh, numbers three and four, two nice rooms in the front. First left at the top of the stairs. Here's your keys. We got visitors, Sam. That's right. One of them is a friend of yours. Oh? Inspector Chu. No. The other one's his sergeant. What do they want? Business, he said. <sighs> well, now, don't go looking all worried. It could be a hundred different things. He's going to rake it all up again. No, he's not. That's all over and done with now. Ah, perhaps Mr Creswell invited him down for the wedding. Oh, don't talk silly. You should have told him we were full up. Well, now who's talking silly? That's the quickest way to make him think we've got something to hide. Who's got something to hide? Oh, uh, I never heard you come down, Inspector. It's this soft carpet of yours, Sam. 
It's exactly the same as I remember it from 12 years ago. Shabby and dirty. Would you like some tea, Inspector? Hello, Peg. I didn't think you'd recognise me. I didn't until Sam told me. You've aged. You haven't changed a bit. I'm like our carpet. Still shabby and dirty. Do you want some tea? No, I don't think so. I'll have a drink in a minute. My sergeant's taking a bath. All right? I'll get him some clean towels. You're a lucky man, Sam. I think so. Is the bar open? It's always open to visitors. Buy a drink. Uh, very nice of you, sir. Uh, what'll it be? Is it the same lousy beer you had last time? That's what brand, sir. We're a tight house. Point? Yeah. And you have what you want. Here you are, sir. Oh, stick it on my bill. Ah, that's better. Do they still talk about it in the village? Talk about what? Oh, don't slow the conversation down, Sam. You know what I mean. The kidnapping. Oh, you've all tried to forget it. Where do you think the body was hidden? The ground was rock hard. It couldn't have been buried, and the snow kept him in. Just staying for a couple of days, then, are you? It was a local job, no doubt about it. Whoever did it's probably still in the village. One of your customers, Sam. That's over and forgotten. You and Peg never had any children, then? How's your wife? Good one, that, Sam. Um, a hit. As far as I know, she's quite well. Oh. You open the landlord? Hello, Bill. Oh. Of course I am, why? Oh, you haven't switched your front light on. Hey? Oh, nor I have. Oh, when's this damn rain gonna stop? Could spoil everything for tomorrow. As long as it doesn't spoil the poaching. You speak, mister. You remember me? Surely, Bill. Once seen, never forgotten. It's the copper. Chu. Inspector Chu. None other. What are you doing down here? Complete a poaching. Big pheasant gang. And I've been sent down to solve it. Oh, you'd have to be a bit smarter than you was last time to catch me. Probably right there, Bill. You were just talking about the kidnapping. Ah, uh, sad business. Ancient history now. Remember all the horrible things you threatened to do if you found the bloke who did it? Used to make my blood run cold. Oh, and you know better then, did I? No better now, then. Well, as I said, a long time ago. That was right, Inspector. We've all tried to forget about it. I wish I could. Will you be staying long? Well, now, that all depends on whether this new evidence leads anywhere or not. New evidence? Oh, probably doesn't mean anything, but we have to follow these things through, you know. No wasting your time. Oh, tell me more, Bill. I ain't got nothing to tell you. Beg your pardon, my mistake. You spoke as if you knew something. Well, I know I'm not telling you, and neither will no one else. All wind is it, Bill, as usual. You're so clever, aren't you? Yeah, but he wasn't a bit more clever 12 years ago. Made a proper fool of you then, didn't we? No. No, let him talk, Sam. So you reckon you made a fool of me, eh, Bill? And how could someone as thick as you possibly do that? Thick, am I, mister? Oh, let me tell you Take something. Take your hands I... off him. Who are you? I'm a police officer. Oh. Oh, mate of his, are you? Oh, no wonder you were so brave, Inspector. You ready then, Sergeant? Yes, sir. We'll have our little chat some other time, Bill. We're going out, Sam. Right. Well, unless we make an arrest, I'll see you all anon. Good night, gentlemen. Good night, sir. Well... You should be damn pleased with yourself, Bill. Oh, it gets me on the raw. He always did. I was deliberately leading you on, trying to get you to say more than you should. Not that you needed much pushing. Oh, I never told him nothing, did I? Didn't have to. What you looking out of the window for? Just looking where they're going. Oh, it stopped raining. Uh, oh, it could be on their way to Mrs Fulton's house. Well, of course they are. Stands to reason they'd want to go there, don't it? Use your common. Pamela Fulton's a bag of nerves, what with a wedding and everything. She's never really got over her boy being took. Ah, she'll be all right. Does uh, Mr. Creswell know they're here? Yeah, I phoned him. He said we should do nothing and say nothing. Just carry on as usual. Not quite the way you've been acting. Uh, you better tell him about this new evidence they're supposed to have. Yeah, I tell him. I'll tell him. Your 
quiet, sir. I'm fuming. Oh? Uh -huh. You just can't keep your mouth shut, can you? Sir? Everything I do is for a reason. If I pick a quarrel, then there's a reason. He was just going to open his big mouth when you had to come to my rescue. He was going to attack you. I can look after myself. I'm sorry, sir, but I really thought he was going to hit you. Been worth a punch on the nose to learn what he had to say. Yes, sir. Sorry. All right, all right, Sergeant. It's not the end of the world. Ah, you can see the Fulton House now at the end of the lane. Nice looking place. They've got money, I suppose. Husband had a fair old number at the brewery. Manager or something. Hello. There's a car outside. They've got visitors. Pamela! Pamela, where are you? In the sitting room. I just popped around to... Oh, how does she look, Anne? Sarah, you look beautiful. Oh, the dress is lovely. Do you think so? She does remind me of you, Pamela. That's exactly how you looked on your wedding day. All dressed up like a vestal virgin, I remember. Turn round, Sarah, dear. Let Anne see the train. Do you really like it? Really. It's quite perfect. <laughs> now, who can that be? It's nearly ten o'clock. Shall I go? No, no, Tom will see to it. Oh, I hadn't noticed your shoes, Sarah. Aren't they sweet? We bought them when we were in London last week. Sorry to burst in on you like this. Good evening, Mrs Fulton. Remember me? was the first half of Better Never Than Late by R.D. Wingfield. Leslie Sands starred as Inspector Chu. Next week, in the conclusion of Better Never Than Late, the inspector increases the pressure on all the people of the village with some very haunting results. The coordinating producer of the Mystery Project is Barry Morgan. Better Never Than Late by R.D. Wingfield. Inspector Chu, on the eve of retirement, returned to a village where he'd failed to solve a kidnapping case 12 years earlier. Now, nobody is glad to see him, but he's almost happy to step on as many toes as he possibly can. The little beer-brewing town has closed ranks against him, and it's hard to know exactly why. Leslie Sands stars as Inspector Chu in Better Never Than Late. Sorry to burst in on you like this. Good evening, Mrs. Fulton. Remember me? No, I, I'm all right, thank you. Are you sure, Pamela? Let me get you some brandy. I'm all right, really. Silly of me. The, the excitement just caught up, I suppose. I'm so sorry, Inspector. I should be apologising to you, Mrs Fulton, bursting in unannounced like that. You were the last person I expected to see, but let me introduce you. This is my friend, Anne Marlowe. Anne, this is Inspector Chu. It is still, Inspector. Oh, yeah. They only promote you if you're successful. Pleased to meet you, Mrs. Marlowe. How'd you do? And you met my daughter Sarah before, of course. That's not Sarah. Sarah's nearly eight years old with a fringe, freckles and sticky fingers. Uh, I don't remember you. No, you wouldn't. It was too long ago, not worth remembering. But look at you now. A wedding dress. She's getting married tomorrow to Mr. Creswell's nephew. Oh, it's your wedding they're all talking about. Congratulations. But I've come at quite the wrong time, haven't I? You must be very busy. Perhaps another day. Nice to have met you all. Good night. Good night. I'll show you out. All right, Inspector. Why are you here? Possible fresh evidence. I've made myself forget all about it. It wasn't easy, but I did. I don't want the case opened up again. The first time I saw you, Mrs Fulton, you were standing out here. Your eyes were red from crying. You looked at me so hopefully when I came in. You thought I was bringing him back, didn't you? It was a nightmare. I kept telling myself he'd be back, someone would bring him back. Then the doorbell rang, and it was only you. And I've remained a source of disappointment ever since. You'd still like us to catch the person responsible, though, wouldn't you? Not now. I can't even remember what he looked like now. Eyes blue. Hair light brown. 
Weight 22 pounds. Small brown mole left upper arm. Slight scratch on nose. It means nothing to me. It could be someone else's child. Let it rest, Inspector. Please. You're not frightened of anything, are you, Mrs Fulton? No, why should I be? You tell me. I really must compliment you on your new furnishings. Very luxurious. And wasn't that a colour television set I saw in the lounge? Yes. Your husband must be doing well. Sorry I missed him. He's changed his job. He works for Mr Creswell's South American company now. Oh. Oh, that's nice. Promotion, eh? It's getting very late and I have a lot to do. Of course you have. I expect you miss him, your husband. Good night, Inspector. <coughs> What's that? <coughs> Good morning. Oh, a morning, Peg. Why did you have to come back? Everyone asked me that. I thought you at least would be pleased to see me. Oh, why me? Thought you were a friend. Seem to remember one occasion when you were more than friendly. In this very room. I've got more sense now. Oh, well. I'll console myself with a cup of tea, then. Tell me, why do I get the impression that people are afraid I'm going to find something out? I don't know what you're talking about. Will you be in for dinner? I don't expect people to jump for joy at the sight of me, but I'm getting open-faced hostility. We're a small village. All we want is to live our own lives in peace. If you rake up the past, someone's going to get hurt. If you know something, Peg, I wish you'd tell me. I'll go and get your breakfast. What time's the wedding? You're not going. Why not? Who'll be giving the bride away? Mr Cresswell, of course. She's married into money, all right, isn't she? Still good luck to her. Let's hope the money compensates for having somebody like Cresswell as her uncle. Oh, Inspector, there's a phone call for you. Yeah. Dr James. Thank you, Sam. Just what I'm waiting for. Any bets? What on? Result of the tests? It's my body. The Fulton baby. I know it. After 12 years. You go and have your breakfast, Sergeant. I'll take this. All right, sir. Dr James, Inspector Chu here. Oh, yes. Yes, I was asked to phone you through the results of our tests on specimen uh, 83369, the skeleton of a child. Yes. Yes, so there wasn't much doubt about it. A male child. I knew it. Aged about six or seven. Uh, how old? You must have made a mistake about the age. It wasn't more than 11 months. Oh, of course, it's difficult to be precise because it had been buried about 300 years, but our estimate's about right. I should imagine they've uncovered a great plague burial pit. They should come across bags more bones soon, if I'm right. Uh, are you still there, Inspector? Yeah. Yes, I'm still here. I'm sorry if it doesn't help you much. You can't win them all. Goodbye. Damn. Oh, good. I was just going to put your breakfast under the grill. Ta. I pour your coffee, shall I? We can manage, thank you. It's no bother. We can manage. What did the lab say? Is it ours? Well, I'll leave you to it then. Haven't you got any sense, Rust? Sorry, sir, I wasn't thinking. Well, next time, try it. Now, ask me. I don't need to, sir. I can guess. Great plague victim. Been buried about 300 years. Wasn't even the right age. That's that then, sir. Yeah. Get the cases packed. We'll get the next train to town. Oh, I don't think I want this. I'm going to take a walk round the village, see if I've got any friends left. Hmm. Ah, can I help you? Mr. Chesterton in. Mr. Chesterton? The editor. <laughs> You're a bit late, old sport. He's been dead for about six years. Oh. Still, shed no tears. His editorial chair has been ably filled. I'm Bob Hampton. Editor, chief reporter, advertising manager, office boy, and typist. <laughs> Just call me Poobah. 
Now, you'll be Inspector Chu, staying at the Cresswell Arms. Which room? Number four at the front. How do you expect to sell your paper if news spreads as quickly as that? Well, people don't buy our paper for news, Ale Sport. They buy it so they can see their jolly old names in print. Oh, just push those layouts off the chair and sit down. And um, just want to make a cup of coffee. Do you want one? Those are the first kind words spoken to me since I arrived. I'm ready to burst into tears. Yes, I'd like a coffee. Switch the kettle on, would you? By your foot. You were here 12 years ago on the Fulton kidnapping, weren't you? That's right. Why have you come back? We haven't closed our files on this case, you know. It's still open. Mm, good for you. What do you think about it? Rather fizzled out, didn't it? it? Had all the makings of a classic drama. Beautiful mother, lost baby, snow-swept landscape, and it just petered out. Back page stuff. Ah, uh, if you could have found the body, it would have worked wonders for the jolly old story. Wouldn't have done me any harm, either. The kettle's boiling, so I switch it off. Oh, well, please. Uh, do policemen take sugar? A couple of spoonful. We looked everywhere for the body. We couldn't find it. Perhaps Mr Cresswell didn't want you to find it. There we are. Ta. Why wouldn't he want me to find it? Oh, it's just my talk, old boy. I don't know anything. Why have you graced our fair village with a return visit? Just nosing around. Do you want an interview? <laughs> no, thank you, old sport. Very generous and all that, but I'll want all my space for the wedding. Be sure you spell my name right. It's Chu, as in eat, not as in Dr Fu Man. You're never going to the wedding. Why not? Well, I, I thought you were going back to town. How did you know? Uh, news spread. Well, here's some news that hasn't spread yet. I'm staying. Oh, Oh, jolly good. I understand Mrs Fulton's husband won't be there. <laughs> Bit behind the times, old sport. They were divorced years ago. When? Not long after the kidnapping, I think. Now, don't give me that. It would have been headlines in every London daily. Mm, not if Mr Cresswell didn't want it to you be. You can't stop papers from getting news. We're not talking about any ordinary mortal, Inspector. We're talking about the mighty Cresswell. With his money and influence, he gets what he wants, and he didn't want the divorce case published in the papers. So it wasn't. Who divorced who? Uh, the husband divorced her. Adultery? <laughs> Rather. With Cresswell? The co-respondent wasn't named. Of course not. The things you can get away with if you've got money. Thanks for the coffee. See you in church. Cheerio, old sport. Oh, Inspector. Hello, Sergeant. All pack? Yes, sir, but... The... You can unpack mine. I'm staying. Staying? But I thought... The we... way to get on people's nerves is not to do what they want. They all want me to go, so I'm staying. See what that brings forth. Did you want me? Yes, sir. The Chief Superintendent's on the phone. Why don't you say so? you better come with me. He might want both of us. Chew here, sir. You wanted me? It all turned out to be nonsense then, Chu. Why do you say that, sir? This damn skeleton. Nothing to do with your case. Prehistoric or something. A bit later than Stone Age, sir, but too early to be mine. So, there's nothing to keep you there. I wouldn't say that, sir. Well, I would. I've had the local chief constable on the phone. He's received a complaint about you. Oh? What have I done? You've been making a damn nuisance of yourself and you've been upsetting people by calling in the middle of the night. I see. Who complained? An influential friend of the chief constable's. Who brews the worst beer in East Anglia. I know. I've got to order you both back on the next train, Inspector. You're not serious, sir. I never had a leg to stand on and you know it. The skeleton's a museum piece and you've turned up nothing fresh. Not that I'd expect you to after 12 years. I had no case to argue. I had to agree. It's a pity you didn't make sure of your facts first. I, I've found the evidence I was looking for. I intend to make an arrest this afternoon. An arrest? Yes. I know who did it. You do, sir? Shut up. Come on, man. Come on. This isn't a secret service. Give me the facts. Look, this is a manually operated exchange, sir. All calls go through the operator. I see. Yes, yes. Very wise. So I can stay? You're quite certain you know who did it? Yes, sir. And you can make it stick? Yes, sir. I hope so, Chu, because I'm going to defy the chief constable, which will go very much against me if you're wrong. Stay as long as you need to. Thank you, sir. Report to me later. Good luck. Thank you. Ah. Hello, Inspector. Ha. 
If it isn't the president of the Cresswell fan club. Watch it, old sport. <laughs> that sort of talk doesn't go down too well in these parts. And how's the press? No remarkable set of sobriety for Saturday afternoon. I thought you'd be inside. Apparently it's by invitation only. The curate's just turned me away as if I was Satan's private ambassador. Never mind, old sport. You can read all about it in the Waverton Gazette. I'll send you a copy. Ah, there's Cresswell's car coming. I'd better get inside before the bride. Uh, don't forget to touch your forelock if he speaks to you. Oh, oh what a lovely bride. Just one moment, please, Mr. Cresswell. Uh, Miss Fulton. That's it. Fine. Thank you. Uh, now, can I have a bride of her own, Mr. Cresswell? Yes, of course. Uh, could you come over here, Miss Fulton? Oh, a nice day for it, Mr. Cresswell. Ah, Inspector Chu. Still with us, I see. Yes, like the poor. Hmm, seems I didn't lodge my complaint in a high enough quarter. I should have gone straight to the Chief Commissioner. Does Buckingham Palace shut on Saturday afternoons, then? <laughs> I obviously don't overawe you. That's a refreshing change, anyway. Good day, Inspector. Funny we never found your son, wasn't it? Thank you, Miss Fulton. Ready now, Mr Creswell? Uh, I'm sorry, my dear. I must have a word with this gentleman. Would you excuse me? I'll join you in the porch in just a moment. Oh, y yes, of course. I think I'd better talk to you in a more private place. Can you spare a few moments? We're public service. Servants, always at your disposal. What about the wedding? They won't start until I'm there. This way. Where are we? The celebrated crypt? Yes, it stretches underneath the length of the church. Anything wrong, Mr. Creswell? Well, don't let us disturb you, Bill. What are you doing down here, Bill? Nothing worth pinching, is there? If you must know, I'm pumping the organ. It's my weekend job. Highly commendable, if it keeps you out of mischief. Uh, the inspector and I wish to have a little talk, Bill, in private. Oh, well, uh, you'll find a couple of chairs over there, sir. Sh shall I get them for you? No, you carry on. We can manage. Sit down, inspector. Well, I expect you can see a few changes in the village since your last visit. And it's very mild for the time of year, isn't it? Meaning I should come to the point. I remembered you as a much politer man, Inspector. And I remembered this village as a much more law-abiding place. People were so anxious to help me then, now they run a mile at the sight of me. When I think of all your own kindness and assistance... That was the least I could do. I mean, it wasn't as if it was your own son. It was a long time ago. I've been wondering when you were going to say that. Everyone else has. It's today's catchphrase. What good can it do to rake up the past now? Public's given me a job to do. I'd do it. Uh, talking of jobs, I, uh, I understand you retire from the force next week. Good news travels fast. Mm, got anything lined up? That's a sore point. Well, I'm a moment. very good judge of character. You've impressed me, too. Still, things may be different if I can make a success of this case. Uh, look, you know my local business, the brewery. No one around here can avoid knowing it. Well, we're looking for someone, someone like yourself, as it happens. Ah. We want a security officer. Must be ex-police, preferably single. You're not married, are you? Well, yes and no. Mostly no. Oh, it doesn't matter. Uh, we want someone about your age. Oh, that's handy. £2,800 a year to start. Company car, free pension scheme. Should eke out your police pension admirably. What do you say? Almost as if it was tailor-made for me. You have all the qualifications. Do you want the job? At £2,800 a year, I'd love it. <laughs> oh, I like you, Inspector. We understand each other. Oh, that's all settled, then. <laughs> all settled? Good. Oh, well, I've, uh, I've kept them waiting upstairs long enough. Oh, um, when could you start? No rush, is it? Well, that depends. Well, let's see. I've, uh, I've got to make an arrest, and I'll have to take it through to at least the magistrate's court. They delay my retirement, of course, say, uh, say two or three weeks. No problem there, I hope. I couldn't keep the job open that long. The person we engage must start Monday week. Ah. <laughs> that lets me out, then. Uh, the early start is essential. Of course, we appreciate we may have to pay a little more for it, say, uh, 3000 a year? Tempting, very tempting. It's at times like this that I curse my scruples. I'm sorry, 
I can't meet your condition. Oh, don't be hasty. Think it over. All it means is you'll have to drop this case, and so what? You can't bring the child back, but you could upset people who have suffered enough. Accept my offer. My conditions of employment are first class. They also seem to be very demanding. When people work for you, Mr. Cresswell, they develop very low moral standards. They want to hide things from tired old policemen who haven't got enough sense to take a handsome bribe. What are they hiding? Why do you think I can tell you? I get bored very easily, you know. Who are you going to arrest? Me? I don't particularly like you, Mr. Cresswell, and I can't see you kidnapping your own son. Cigarette? No, thank you. Yes, he was my son. When did Mrs. Fulton's husband find her? Around about the time the baby was missing. I fixed him up with a job in South America after the divorce. He didn't want to stay here. Well-paid job, I expect. Company car, free pension scheme, lunch and vouchers, the lot. Must be handy to have all these perks at your disposal. I like to help people. Well, if you're not going to arrest me, who is it to be? I can't lie to you. In church. If you'd asked me that question a few minutes ago, my natural honesty would have compelled me to confess I hadn't the faintest idea. But now, I know. When you come to think of it, it's so damn simple. Oh? Got to be somebody you'd go to great lengths to cover up for. I'm still here, if you want me, Mr. Creswell. Uh, thank you, Bill. What's he supposed to be, a member of your personal SS? And you were saying, Inspector? This was an inside job, wasn't it? We don't have to look outside the Fulton household. Uh, Inspector, I've suddenly remembered another vacancy we have in Australia, as it happens. The equivalent of £5,000 a year. Mr. Cresswell... No, listen to me. Free house, servants, car of your choice. You could live like a king. As before, an early start is essential. <laughs> Accept things at their face value, Inspector. Cynics are rarely happy. I'm happy. I'm happier than I've been for a long time. Now, what we're we talking about, something important, I think. Ah, yes, we, we were confining our attention to the members of the happy Fulton household on that winter's night 12 years ago. The husband has just discovered that his baby son isn't his baby son after all. Yours, in fact. Now, that must have taken the edge off what could have been a most enjoyable evening. I don't like your taste in jokes, Inspector. I agree with you. Murder isn't a joking matter. Murder? It was an accident. She only left him for half an hour. She? Well, she didn't know what she was doing. She wasn't even eight at the time. Sarah? You said you knew. Thought I did. My man was the husband. What? Look, Mr. Fulton. He had the motive and the opportunity, and he conveniently popped off to South America afterwards. I... I never gave Sarah a thought. Well, if he'd done it, do you think I'd have covered up for him? You might have felt just the teeniest bit responsible. Tell me about Sarah. Well, the poor child was confused. There was a quarrel, and Sarah ever heard it. Fulton was beside himself. He didn't know what he was saying. He shouted to Pamela that he wanted the baby out of the house. He wasn't having another man's illegitimate child foisted off on him. If the baby stayed, he was leaving. Pamela told him to go. And Sarah heard all this? Yes, she was She was devoted to her father. Absolutely devoted. So, while they were still quarrelling, she went into the nursery and took the baby. And killed it? No, no, no. She took him and hid him. That note wasn't a demand for money. It was a warning to her mother. She wanted Pamela to dump the baby on me, I suppose, so that her father would stay. What went wrong? Well, she, she hid the child in the shed at the bottom of the garden. Remember what the weather was like, that snow? Well, the poor little devil died of exposure. It happens, I'm told. Yeah, it happens. Well, Fulton sent for the police as soon as he discovered the note. That was a pity. There you are. Bill found the baby. Look, why didn't you just tell us what had happened? If it was an accident... I didn't want Sarah branded for killing her brother. She wasn't even eight years old. We don't send children who aren't even eight to prison. You've taken her away, though. Even that's doubtful. I wasn't risking it. I didn't want it made public. My own part in the affair was not altogether commendable. You were worried about yourself, yeah, that I can believe. That was a secondary consideration. I wasn't having a daughter of mine taken away by the police. Yes, you, you might as well know that now. Sarah is mine too. They kept you pretty busy in those days, didn't they? 
Any more of your offspring knocking about? Only Sarah now. Today, she takes the family name, and I can recognize her openly as a Cresswell. Her children, my grandchildren, will inherit their share of the estate. It's all working out beautifully, isn't it? All neat and tidy, no loose ends. Where'd you bury the body? Where all the Cresswells are buried, of course. In the family vault. <laughs> And I thought I'd looked everywhere. Well, most of the villagers attended the funeral. Oh, where was I then? I uh, made certain you were otherwise engaged. It was the day that Sam Fletcher supposedly went into Norwich and you and Peggy were left alone in the pub. So I have you to thank for that, do I? Just as a matter of interest, how much did you pay her? I don't flatter myself she did it for nothing. I'm sorry, Joe. But the important thing was that Sarah wouldn't suffer. <laughs> Fool. Could have been all over and done with 12 years ago. Now, on her wedding day... What do you mean? Well, I shall have to arrest her. Don't be absurd. I've no alternative. I'm a rich man, too. Name your price. I don't want Sarah to be hurt. There was a time, Mr. Cresswell, when the force was my life. Whatever else happened, the job always came first. 12 years ago, when I was fruitlessly looking for a missing baby, my wife was nursing our sick son. Oh, you've got a son, then you understand. He died. He died and I wasn't there. I was here, searching all day and all night. My wife never forgave me, and I can't say I blame her. As I say, the job came first. Oh, I'm sorry. I'd like to make it up to you somehow. Like you made it up to Fulton for seducing his wife? What will happen to Sarah? I'll arrest her. Her magistrate will have to hear the evidence and then she'll be released on bail. Your money will come in handy there. Her actual trial will be a formality. Be over in about ten minutes. And that is all? I expect we'll have to exhume the body. No, Inspector. Oh, I'm afraid so. No! Just to corroborate the fact that it was an accident. It was an accident, wasn't it? Oh, this is ridiculous. Really, Inspector, what evidence do you have? Nothing. We'll have the body. But no proof that Sarah did it. Don't expect any of the villagers to talk. Supposing I brought Mr. Fulton back from South America. He wouldn't be shy about talking now, would he? Especially about your daughter. Do you want me to beg? Gravel? Anything, I'll do it. No, please. I'm sorry. Very well. I shall call off the wedding. Would you wait here, please? I'll bring Sarah down. I don't want the villagers to see. As you wish, sir. Feeling pretty pleased with yourself, aren't you, Inspector? This case has been a black mark against me for 12 years, Bill. Be nice to retire with the slate clean. You should have retired a long time ago. You should never have come back here. Oh, she hasn't got much to worry about. Post-mortem will confirm it was an accident, won't it? Pity about the wedding, though. This way, my dear. But I don't understand. You've met the inspector, Sarah. He has something to say to you. What's this all about? The wedding's half an hour late as it is. Everyone's waiting. You haven't told her? And deny you your moment of triumph? Sarah Fulton? No. It doesn't matter, Sarah. What I was going to say doesn't seem important anymore. But what was Never mind, it? Sarah. Go back upstairs. Tell the vicar to get ready. I'll be there directly. Go on. All right. Thank you, Inspector. For her, not for you. You won't regret it. The offer of both jobs still stands. Save plums like that for your hired thugs, like Bill there. I hope I never see you or this village again. Listening to the concluding half of Better Never Than Late by R.D. Wingfield. Tonight, part one of Murder Repeats Itself. Adapted by Melanie Garrett from the novel Murder in Memoriam by Didier Danix. He's a Belgian author writing a mystery set in France and devised for radio by the BBC. 
history student and researcher is brutally shot to death in Toulouse. Inspector Cadeau and his assistant Borisso set out to backtrack the crime and the victim, a search that takes them to Paris and also 20 years into the past. Gentlemen, just how much longer do you plan holding up these funerals? That is a perfectly legal strike, Inspector. It might be legal, but it is not right. Half of Toulouse is up in arms against you. Would it kill you to wait until this heat wave is over? Rain or shine, we still have rights. Aye, it's what your ancestors fought the revolution for. Okay, okay, well, just... Tell me where you keep the shovel. You can't you bring in scarves. No, but when these grieving widows get their hands on you, I want to give you a decent burial. Look, Inspector, all we want is proper compensation for the work we do. And all they want is to bury their dead. Is that so hard to understand, especially in this heat? Okay. Hear about this. You calm them down a bit, and I'll have a word with them. You know... Reassure them that we know how to look after bodies. And heat like this, we turn the fridges up nice and high. Just look at the butchers. Better leave the negotiating to me, gentlemen. You're obviously used to the customer being dead. Come on! Have a go! Inspector Caddo? Here. Yeah. Oh, message for you, sir. There's been a murder in the Cartier Saint Jerome. Just what we needed another corpse. Have a go! Don't keep me in suspense, poor soul. Who is our killer, then? Uh, I hadn't uh, got quite as far as the killer yet, sir. Mm -hmm. But um, the victim's name is Bernard Thiroux. He was shot twice from the front and then six more times in the back. Local residents reported the shots and our boys found the body when they arrived. Shot eight mm. times in broad daylight? There must have been witnesses. Uh, none, but I've got uniforms out there looking for the murder weapon. Okay, so what else do we know about the victim? Um, he's a student from Paris, born on the 20th of December, 1961. Which makes him, what, 24? Yeah. So, if he's from Paris, what was he doing getting killed all the way down here in Toulouse? He really? No real clues in his wallet. All we found was this photo, presumably his girlfriend. Plus 8,000 francs in traveller checks and this receipt dated yesterday from a restaurant here in Toulouse. Mm, 400 francs for two. Mm. At least he won't have had any regrets or had his last supper. Now, all we need to do is find out who was holding that other fork, eh, Borussor? <laughs> well, uh, you did? Excellent, we're on our way. A gun's just been found by the river. Come on, we can call at that restaurant and check out this receipt on the way. Right. Here's the gun, sir. Excellent. Now we're getting somewhere. Do you think it's the murder weapon? At the very least, it's a revolver found abandoned in the river right next to where the victim was shot. Who found it? The man in the green uniform. His name is Durand. Monsieur Durand, yes. I wonder if we could have a word. I'm Inspector Cadin of the Commissariat de Toulouse. Pleased to meet you. Is this where you found the gun? Uh, no, it was further over there. We're working on the flood defences along there, and I spotted it lying on the riverbed. Figured it could be important, so I fished it out with a stick uh, in case you needed to, you know, test it for prints. Well, it was good of you to be so careful, but our killer won't have left any prints on this. You can tell, by looking. I can tell without even looking. This is the Underworld's pistol of choice, and unless I'm mistaken, it comes from a batch of 300 stolen by Etta near the Spanish border. They turn up from time to time in cases such as these. Let's us know we're dealing with a pro, and pros don't leave prints. Hey, you guys are good. And you, monsieur. You've been a big help. No problem. Good luck, your killer. We'll do our best. You can count on that. 
Well, Burassol, Monsieur Durand was certainly impressed with your analysis. Civilians often are, but it's pretty straightforward when you think about it. There is just one problem. Oh? The part about it being a professional hit. Tiro was shot twice from the front at close range, then six more times in the back while he lay on the ground. It's a bit OTT, don't you think? Well, perhaps in the heat of the moment. No. A pro would take one shot to the head or the heart and be done with it. None of this bang, 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 cowboy-style shootout. Whoever shot Bernard Tiro felt very strongly about wanting him dead. A crime of passion, perhaps? So, maybe it's time we spoke to someone who felt passionately about him. That waiter seemed pretty confident about which hotel they said they were staying at. Maybe Tiro's girlfriend's still there. Certainly worth a try. I'll call in on my way home. I'm Inspector Cadin of the Commissariat de Toulouse. What do you want? May I come in? Something happened to Bernard. Please, sit down. Mademoiselle, uh, could I perhaps get you a glass of water? Uh, here, let me turn this down. Look, you're making me nervous. Just tell me whatever it is you've come to say, would you? I'm afraid Bernard has been murdered. Murdered? Late yesterday afternoon, not far from the hotel. He still had his passport on him. There really is no doubt. But why? That's what I intend to find out. When did you last see him? Yesterday. I mean, the night before that. He left early in the morning. I was still sleeping. He had some research to do at the municipal archives. He said he would be gone most of the day. You weren't alarmed when he didn't come back? I didn't know what time the archives closed. And as midnight approached, it didn't occur to you to inquire. Uh, where were you yesterday afternoon? Here in the hotel, all day. I had lunch in the restaurant. You can ask the waiter. And after lunch? It isn't unusual for him to stay out all night, you know. In Paris... You lived together? Yes. Bernard moved in with me about six months ago. Mm -hmm. But he would often go off on his own and stay out all night. Any idea why? depression. It's in his family. His father was killed during a riot in Paris not long before Bernard was born, and his mother never recovered. She's still completely has -banned. I see. So, what was Bernard doing at the municipal archives? Researching. He's a historian. Researching what? Some secret project of his. He said he would tell me about it when he knew he was right. Right. About what? I just told you he wouldn't say, and I didn't press him. Now, if that's all, Inspector... You've got somewhere to be. Actually, I wanted to call Bernard's mother to let her know what's happened. Yes. Yes, of course. Um, please, tell her we'll be in touch. By the way, Bernard was carrying a fair old sum in traveller's checks. We were on our way to Morocco on holiday, but he insisted on stopping here. We'll need you to stay here for a few more days. Don't worry about the hotel, Bill. You'll be our guest. Morning, Bonsoir. Morning, sir. I take it you found your woman? Yes, she was still at the hotel after all. Oh, facing the relatives is one part of the job I'll never get used to. Mm. How did she take the bad news? Surprisingly well, as a matter of fact. If anything, the waiter at the restaurant seemed more shook up about Tio's death than she did. You think she did it? I think she's definitely worth keeping an eye on. Now, please tell me you have something to report. Oh, just the same old collection of drunks and layabouts in the cells from last night, and an eyewitness has turned up in the Tiro case. An eyewitness? <laughs> That's brilliant. Some bloke who saw it on the news and came forward voluntarily. Says he noticed Bernard coming out of the town hall the evening of the murder, and he started to follow him down the street. Went out of nowhere... But back up a minute, Bourassol. What was the witness doing following the victim? I thought it best not to pursue that particular line of inquiry. <sighs> the important thing is, he wasn't the only one following him. Don't tell me. Claudine Chenet? Not unless she's a white-haired Parisian male of average height and build, wearing a grey business suit and black shoes. Parisian? How could he tell that? 
because he was driving a dark Renault 30 TX with Paris plates on. Gouversol, you are a genius. <laughs> Your witness is the first one to have seen our murderer. Lunch is on me. Sounds good. Uh, boss, if our killer has Paris plates, then he must have followed Tiro all the way here. Good point, Bovasol. Contact the auto route patrols and toll booths and petrol stations between here and Paris. That's a top of the range car. There can't have been more than ten of them on the Paris Toulouse road in the last few days. Sorry I'm late, sir. I have some calls to make for the case. You're quite right. The case must come first. In fact, since we are so pressed for time, I've taken the liberty of ordering. Now, I assume a small glass of wine will not be refused. Oh, just a small one, then. <laughs> Here we go, gentlemen. Mules Marinier. The compliments of the chef. Eh? Thank, Thank you. you very much. Now, Bourassol, I take it you've no objection to mixing business with pleasure? The ballistics report is back. Fire away. Mm, this is delicious. Mm. What do you suppose they put in the sauce? Mm, is it uh, tarragon? Well, remind me to ask the waiter. Now, the gun found in the river was a perfect match for the murder weapon. It was indeed from the stolen batch, and as you predicted, there were no prints of any kind on it. In other words, the murder weapon is a dead end. And so is our car chase. Mm. No one's seen it anywhere. It turns out there are a lot more luxury Renaults in Paris than we might have imagined. Mm. It's going to take some time to track them all down. What about the petrol stations? Did you call them? All of them. Didn't need a calculator to work it out. A car like that has a 70-litre tank. If we assume he filled up before he left to lose, then he had to stop at least once before Paris. But no one saw him in either direction. What makes you think he uh, left to lose? His car's registered in Paris. He follows them down here, does the business, then heads back up north. Seems the most likely scenario to me. Mm -hmm. oh, probably right. But let's not start making assumptions this early in the game. Get someone to start checking all the local stations. Okay. So, what's next for us? We hit the books. Hmm? Claudine said Bernard was researching at the town hall. He was a history student, so... Maybe it's time we started digging in his past. Opens a game by interviewing librarians. It's not like Tiro was bored to death, is it? No. But he was murdered on his way back from these archives. Maybe his research uncovered something someone wanted kept secret. I thought you said he was a historian. Why would anyone be interested in what he had to say anyway? <laughs> Inspector Cadet, I presume. <laughs> Please come in. As I said on the phone, we're interested in consulting some archives in connection with a murder inquiry. Yes, yes, after your call, I, I took the liberty of bringing the files Monsieur Tiro consulted up here into my office. Ah. It being such a, a delicate matter, I thought you might welcome the privacy. Very good of you. What kind of files are they anyway? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not too sure, to, to be honest. It's, it's not really my area. Uh, but they appear to be administrative records from the 40s. He seems to have concentrated on files beginning with D. D, eh? Well, let's see what we've got. D is for dairy rationing, deeds to property, demolitions, depreciation, dereliction of duties. Well, it's certainly all here. Ah, uh, well, uh, not, not quite all of it. Uh, I'm only three months away from retirement, and these boxes are getting too heavy for me. Boussol, why don't you go with Monsieur Lacousson and make a start on the files downstairs, hmm? We'll meet back here, compare notes later. Just as well I sharpened my pencil this morning. Closing up in about 15 minutes, boss. Mm -hmm. oh, ask me anything about decontamination of water supplies in the Toulouse area in 1942. Go on, ask me. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, Boris, all I was... I was elsewhere. What have you got there? Deportations. The first convoy of children to Auschwitz. Makes for grim reading. Look at this. It's from Pierre Laval, dated 29th of September, 1942. Laval? Wasn't he vice president under the Vichy regime? Oh, that's right. 
He sent a telegram to all the local prefects telling them not to split up Jewish families prior to deportation. Listen to this. Taking into account the strong emotions these barbaric separations arouse, I have asked the German army to ensure that the children are no longer taken from their parents. Instead, they will be deported with them. Taking their kids away was too barbaric, so they sent them all to Auschwitz instead. Mm. Let me see that. You look at this. Have you ever seen such meticulous paperwork in all your life? And every one of them carefully initialed A.V. I wonder what ever happened to Mr. A.V. No doubt he was tried as a war criminal at the Liberation. Aye, and sent to some disease-free jail where his children could come and visit and then go home to be tucked up safe in their beds at night. Oh, let's call it a day. We've earned a drink, don't you? Oh, aye, OK. Oh, I promised that old guy would shift all his boxes back downstairs for him before we left. Don't want him to go popping his clogs before he gets his gold watch, do we? Sante? And to you, Burasol. So, what's next? Hmm. I think it's time... We had another chat with Claudine Chenet before we head up to Paris and see what we can find out there. What did you really make of her, boss? She was a bit too composed for my liking. Didn't seem particularly surprised, either. Surprised at what? Everything, really. Bernard staying out all night without warning. Bernard turning up dead in a daylight shootout. Seemed to take it all pretty much in a stride. Maybe she was in shock. Maybe once she'd had a chance to take it all in. Oh, maybe you're right. Anyway, you can judge for yourself in the morning. I said we'd take it to formally identify the body. Mm. Come on, drink up. I'll give you a lift home. I'm sorry, Inspector. It's the shock of seeing him like that. He was such a good person, you know. I just can't believe he's gone. Please, don't apologise. We know this must be a terrible ordeal for you. Boursal, let's see if you can get a glass of water for Mademoiselle Chenet. No, honestly, I'm fine. Please, let's just... You said you had some more questions. Perhaps you should at least sit down, Mademoiselle. Yes, thank you. Oh, I promised I would call Bernard's mother. What should I tell her? Only that the investigation is progressing. We're looking into all possibilities. Such as? We have reason to believe the killer may have followed you from Paris. And the question we keep coming back to is, why? From Paris? Again, we can't be certain, but we're working on this assumption for the moment. There's something I meant to ask you yesterday. You said that Bernal's father was killed during a street riot. Was he a rioter or a policeman? Um, well, definitely not a policeman anyway. His name was Roger Thiro, and he was a history teacher. I'm not too sure of the whole ins and outs of it, but I think it was some kind of horrible accident. Why do you ask? Any background we can get is useful in a case like this, really. Well, I'm sure Madame Thiroux would be happy to tell you anything you want to know. In that case, if you have no objections, maybe I'll join you for the trip back up to Paris. Yes, of course. But won't we need our own car while we're there, sir? Yes, Bourassol, which is why you will be travelling up separately. It'll give you a chance to call in and double-check the petrol stations along the way. too cold, I can turn down the air conditioning. No, no, I'm fine, thanks. It makes a very pleasant change. So, what is it you're studying, anyway? History. Bernard. Are you working on the war years, too? Neither of us are. He was a medievalist, and I'm looking at resettlement of the area surrounding Paris, where the walls of the city used to be... What is it? Sorry? You're staring at me. I'm not staring. Looking. And, of course, listening. Well, could you look at something else? You're making me nervous. Like you think I'm guilty or something. Okay, I confess I was staring. It's an occupational hazard when the witnesses are as attractive as you. Claudine! You can't just pull over on the motorway! 
What do you intend to do, Inspector? Call the cops? Let's get one thing clear. I didn't agree to give you a lift so that you could hit on me, all right? No, of course not. I didn't mean... I am so sorry. I'll get out here if you'd rather. I said I'd drop you, so I will. The first Paris exit is just up ahead now. Where do you want dropped? Claudine, please, I really do not want to fall out... Let's just have the radio on, shall we? Pick a station. We hear, Inspector Dalbois. Glad to see the Paris police still have the Playboy Empire under close surveillance, putting the subscription through on expenses. Are we? God, and you scared the life out of me. <laughs> oh, hello. Oh, don't worry, he's with me, and he knows how to keep his mouth shut. Don't you, Bougasol? If you say so, boss. So, is this a social call? Sadly, not. But that doesn't mean we can't have a little fun, you know, take a few chances, have a few laughs, maybe even bend a few rules along the way, be just like old times. Hmm? I've got a bad feeling about this. What is it you want? We are working a murder case out of Toulouse, and we've been doing a little digging over its central records this morning. Mm -hmm. It turns out that our victim's father also appears to have died in very strange circumstances, going back 20 years or so. October the 17th? 1961, to be precise. The Battle of Paris. Uh -huh. <laughs> you don't have to pick your cases, Kaidan. What well, Battle of Paris? During the Algerian War, there was a mandatory curfew for North Africans, which, naturally, they weren't too happy about. So one night, they decided to take to the streets in peaceful protest. Only the police were waiting for them, and it turned into a bloodbath, with bodies turning up all over Paris. Bodies? As in plural? <laughs> well, depending on whose figures you believe, it was either a few or a few hundred. But what's this got to do with your murder in Toulouse? Uh, we're not sure. But 24 years ago, for no apparent reason, Thiro Senior was the only European to have been killed in the Battle of Paris. Now, for no apparent reason, Thiro Junior is also lying in a mortuary. And? When I saw the father's date of death, I got to thinking. Uh, supposing Tiro Senior was actually a double agent for the Algerians, and it was discovered by the French Secret Service. Maybe someone used the confusion of the riot to do a little housekeeping? After all, nobody likes a traitor, especially during wartime. Let me get this straight. Your theory is that the French Secret Service executed a French citizen more than 20 years ago, mm -hmm. and now they've come back to get his son? No wonder you never get promoted, Kada. You laugh if you want, <laughs> but don't stand there and tell me you don't think these things happen. Well, what's the motive? Did your victim find a secret stash of dirty money that's been under the floorboards for the last 20 years? Well, why not? It usually boils down to money in the end. Well, that's what makes the world go round. But, but what exactly is it you want from me? Unauthorised access to the classified documents, of course. Why did I know you were going to say that? You, you do realise that what you're asking is actually more than my job's worth. Which is why we're asking so nicely. Roger Thiroud. T-H-I-R-A-U-D. Now, do you need the date of birth?
have just heard part one of Murder Repeats Itself by Melanie Garrett, adapted from the novel Murder in Memoriam by Didier Danix. Heard in the cast today, Jimmy Chisel as Inspector Cardin, Mark McDonald as Borisso, Emma Curry as Claudine, and Findlay McLean as Dubois. The play was directed in London at the BBC by Bruce Young. The executive producer of The Mystery Project is Bill Howell. Our coordinating producer is Barry Morgan. I'm Bob Boving, thanking you for listening and inviting your comments. See you next week. Our serial currently is Murder Repeats Itself, adapted by Melanie Garrett from the novel by Didier Ganix, Murder in Memoriam. It all happens in France in 1985. A crime in Toulouse starts a trail that leads to Paris and events that occurred 20 years earlier. As we begin part two, we should refresh your mind about the things that happened last week. The victim's name is Bernard Thirault. He was shot twice from the front and then six more times in the back. Local residents reported the shots and our boys found the body when they arrived. Shot eight <laughs> times in broad daylight? There must have been witnesses. Uh, none, but I've got uniforms out there looking for the murder weapon. Okay, so what else do we know about the victim? Um, he's a student from Paris, born on the 20th of December, 1961. Which makes him, what, 24? Yeah. So, if he's from Paris, what was he doing getting killed all the way down here in Toulouse? There are other peculiarities about this shooting. For instance... Tio was shot twice from the front at close range, then six more times in the back while he lay on the ground. It's a bit OTT, don't you think? Well, perhaps in the heat of the moment. No. A pro would take one shot to the head or the heart and be done with it. None of this bang, 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 cowboy-style shootout. Whoever shot Bernard Thirault felt very strongly about wanting him dead. However, Bernard Thirault wasn't alone in the South. He had a traveling companion from Paris, a girl named Claudine. Bernard moved in with me about six months ago. But he would often go off on his own and stay out all night. Any idea why? Depression. It's in his family. His father was killed during a riot in Paris not long before Bernard was born. And his mother never recovered. She still completely has burned. I see. So, what was Bernard doing at the municipal archives? Researching. He's a historian. Researching what? Some secret project of his. But as a visitor to the city, who would even know he was there? or that he had a secret project. We have reason to believe the killer may have followed you from Paris. And the question we keep coming back to is, why? From Paris? Again, we can't be certain, but we're working on this assumption for the moment. There's something I meant to ask you yesterday. You said that Bernal's father was killed during a street riot. Was he a rioter or a policeman? Um, well, definitely not a policeman anyway. His name was Roger Thiro, and he was a history teacher. In Paris, the two detectives begin their paper chase into closed records of both the Algerian War and the Nazi occupation, and start pulling strings in the document section of the Sûreté by pressuring an old colleague, Dagois. What is it you want? We are working a murder case out of Toulouse, and we've been doing a little digging over its central records this morning. Mm -hmm. It turns out that our victim's father also appears to have died in very strange circumstances, going back 20 years or so. October the 17th, 1961, to be precise. The Battle of Paris. Uh -huh. <laughs> you don't have to pick your cases, can What well, Battle of Paris? During the Algerian War, there was a mandatory curfew for North Africans, which naturally they weren't too happy about. So one night they decided to take to the streets in peaceful protest. Only the police were waiting for them and it turned into a bloodbath with bodies turning up all over Paris. Bodies? 
As in plural? Well, depending on whose figures you believe, it was either a few or a few hundred. But what's this got to do with your murder in Toulouse? Uh, we're not sure. But, 24 years ago, for no apparent reason, Thierry Senior was the only European to have been killed in the Battle of Paris. Now, for no apparent reason, Thierry Junior is also lying in a mortuary. And? When I saw the father's date of death, I got to thinking. Uh, supposing Tiro Senior was actually a double agent for the Algerians, and it was discovered by the French Secret Service. Maybe someone used the confusion of the riot to do a little housekeeping? After all, nobody likes a traitor, especially during wartime. Let me get this straight. Your theory is that the French Secret Service executed a French citizen more than 20 years ago, mm -hmm. and now they've come back to get his son. No wonder you never get promoted, Cad. You laugh if you want, <laughs> but don't stand there and tell me you don't think these things happen. But what's the motive? Did your victim find a secret stash of dirty money that's been under the floorboards for the last 20 years? Well, why not? It usually boils down to money in the end. Well, that's what makes the world go round. But, but what exactly is it you want from me? Unauthorised access to the classified documents, of course. Why did I know you were going to say that? You, you do realise that what you're asking is actually more than my job's worth. Which is why we're asking so nicely. Roger Thiroud. T-H-I-R-A-U-D. Now, do you need the date of birth? And three freaks. This is your idea of buying lunch, is it? It's your generosity we're interested in here, Dalbois. Well, what have you got for us? Pretty slim pickings, I'd say. According to this, the closest thing to a political affiliation is that your man signed the Stockholm Appeal in 1950. Was that about uh, Algeria? No, it was a, a bleeding heart liberal ban the bomb affair. <laughs> Not particularly radical. Half the members of Parliament signed it. Mm. Anything else? Well, there's one strange thing. They never did an autopsy. Fairly unusual, I would have thought. A school teacher shot in the head in central Paris. Personally, I'd have put serious money on there having been a post-mortem. Uh -huh. oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Here's a list of clothing and personal effects found in the body. Ah, let me see that. Yeah, wool suit, blue shirt, white underpants. As long as they were men's, who cares? <laughs> A bill for 1,498 francs for a TV set and a cinema ticket for the Midi Minui cinema. Ah, issued just hours before the time of death. That's not much to go on, really, is it? But do you know this uh, Midi Minui? Well, I've never been there, but I remember it as strictly B-movie horror flicks. You know, the sort of thing, Dracula and Frankenstein. Frankly, no immediate connection to the Algerian war is jumping off the page here. Oh, this is a waste of time. But you know as well as I do that hundreds of people were killed on the streets of Paris that night. Their bodies were washing up out of the Seine for weeks afterwards. There has to be a record Any somewhere. Any official records will be well and truly sealed with no access at all for at least 50 years, or in a case like this, even a hundred. Okay. So, what about unofficial sources? Well, yes... There is an ex-police photographer I know of who was there that night. All his film was lost, but he's still worth speaking to. His name is Mark Rosner. You know, I can probably find his number. Uh, don't bother. I think I've got it, actually. I bumped into him a while back on a case I was working on. <clears throat> what do you mean his film was lost? Oh, it's a bit complicated, really. You see, Rosner was always a bit weird. Weird? Well, as you say, he was a bit too enthusiastic in his work with corpses. Don't tell me. No, 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 nothing like that, no. He just likes posing them for pictures. Anyway, when he was sacked, he made the mistake of trying to blackmail the department into a better severance package on the back of the riot photos. <laughs> Only his lab was mysteriously broken into and everything was stolen. Well, 
well, well. Long time no see, Kedda. Uh, what can I do you for? No, wait, that's more your line, isn't it? Let's just say I need you to put me in the picture over something. <laughs> Touché. By the way, this is Burasol. But don't worry, he doesn't show up on film. Pleased to meet you. How come you've drawn the short straw? A question I ask myself every four minutes. Uh, speaking of questions, here's one for you. October 17th, 1961. You're investigating the Battle of Paris? You know your history, Rosner. I'm impressed. Cut to the chase, Cardin. What is it you want? We need someone who can fill us in on what really happened that night. I give you my word, anything you tell us will stay off the record. That night was a defining moment in my life. I've got no problem talking about it. On the contrary. Brandy? Please. So, what exactly is it that you want to know? One of the victims that night was a man named Roger Thirault. He was shot in the head at close range. Apparently the only European casualty of the night. We're trying to find out why he was killed. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. No must have taken 300 photos, and I don't recall seeing any European faces in the prints. Apart from the cops, that is. They let you take the photos? Let me? I could hardly keep up with them. Everywhere I turned, it was over here, Rosner. Get one of me and this one. And there'd be some idiot posing as a hunter, with one foot in some poor sod's back. And all your pictures are, uh, missing? <laughs> Stolen, yeah. But I do have something which might interest you. Mm -hmm. Did you know that a Belgian film crew was on the scene filming that night? When my negatives were stolen, I contacted the director to tell him my story. He's never been able to broadcast the tapes. Kept getting hit with court orders, and eventually they gave up. Yeah, here we are. Don't tell me. Yep, I've got a copy of their film. Rosner, you are a genius. I don't get your hopes up too much. It was mayhem that night. It makes for pretty grim viewing, that's for sure. Here, grab the other side of this, would you, put us all? <clears throat> Just as well I kept this old projector, eh? I do all my wedding stuff in video now. There. And action. <clears throat> okay. So this is in the Champs-Élysées, heading up towards Place de la Concorde. My guess is that the film crew was heading for the Madeleine at this stage. The Madeleine? Well, not long after the march started, word went out that a dozen or so cops had been killed at the Madeleine, and so everyone started flocking there. But it turned out to be duff information. But it certainly had everyone up to high, though. I counted six dead Algerians, to say nothing of the wounded. Oh, okay, look. This is the opera now. See? There's the Café de la Paix. Where did you go from there? Ah, oh, I hitched a ride in a police van. And we headed up to Bonne Nouvelle. Now, oh, you should have seen these guys. They were armed to the teeth and out for blood. Bonne Nouvelle? Isn't that where the Midi Minwe cinema is? That's right. I'll never forget it. They were showing invasion of the body snatchers. <laughs> Talk about art imitating life, eh? Our victim had a cinema ticket on him when he was shot. Well, the Belgian film crew arrived on the scene shortly after this. They were filming outside the cinema. There were more dead up around Bonne Nouvelle than anywhere else. Well, apart from inside police headquarters... They killed people inside police HQ. That can't be right. Yeah, it may not be right, but it's certainly true. Do you know that the official death toll that night was four? Oh. Multiply that by 50 and you're getting somewhere nearer the truth. A contact of mine at the coroner's office told me that the next morning he was called out to the little garden behind Notre Dame. You know, where they're building that underground car park? Uh -huh. Anyway, mysteriously, there were 48 bodies there, all of whom had been clubbed to death. Funny how it never made the news. <laughs> oh, 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 wait a minute. Here you go. This is Bonne Nouvelle now. Hey, look! There's your midi mean -me cinema. Is there any way you can slow this thing down? Look, number five, Avenue Bonne Nouvelle. Isn't that Madame Thiro's address? My God. I don't believe it. What? That's Roger Thiro. What the bloody hell is he doing carrying flowers in a kickbox in the middle of a ride? Wait a minute. Uh, who's this? Stop the film. Stop it! I do not believe it, Rosner. 
What have you been playing at? Come again? You've got a film of a man being executed by a cop, and you've just let it gather dust for the last 20 years. Hey, did you do his offer something, Inspector? We just saw hundreds of people being killed by cops, and no one has ever worried about them. Oh, yes. Yes, of course, yes. You're quite right, but... But that is all going to change, starting with that cop who killed Kiro. I've got a contact of police intelligence. Maybe he can get us an ID on this guy. Rosner, can you make a print of his face? It'd be a pleasure. grateful to you for coming, Inspector. I can't imagine how difficult this has been for you, Madame Thiroux. Uh, First your husband and now your son. Yes, thank you. When I made this appointment, I wanted to talk about Bernard, but since then, something has come to light. About Bernard? About the 17th of October, 1961. How can that possibly help you? I was hoping it might help you. Uh, would you mind if I open the shutters on this side of the room? Oh, no, please, Inspector. I, I'd, I'd rather you didn't. A beautiful day like today, they really should be open. Uh, Let a little light in, air the place out a bit. <clears throat> your, uh, your shutters seem to be stuck, madame. Have you painted them sharp or something? Just leave them, will you? Ah, there we go, that What gives you the right... Close them. It has been over 20 years, madame. There is nothing to see, I promise you. I don't need to look out the window, Inspector. I see it all the time. You were standing here at this window, weren't you? Yes. Standing right where you are now. I, I tried to call out. I, I screamed down to him to warn him. But the noise of the riot was deafening. And you never told anyone what you saw? I tried to tell them. It was terrible. I was heavily pregnant. Bernard was due any day. They didn't believe you? Oh, they said I was hysterical. That I couldn't accept what had happened, so instead I was making wild accusations against the police, accusing them of killing my husband. But they just said, Why would a policeman shoot your husband, madame? It doesn't make any sense. Could you tell me what you saw? I, I screamed to warn Roger, you know, but he didn't look up. I saw the policeman grab him from behind, and I heard the gunshot. It might sound crazy to you, but I know what I saw, Inspector. Madame, I believe you. You do? You believe me? I have seen it too. A Belgian film crew got it all on film. There's a film? Would you like to see where the cameraman was standing? Come. Please. I... That's it. Please. Two more steps. Come on. It's okay. I'm here. Please. Come closer. There. There, you see? See the newspaper offices? They must have been crouched in that lane just there. The film shows your husband walking up the street from around that corner there. He's carrying a cake box and... A bunch of mimosas. My favourite. They fell on the ground all around him. I haven't looked out the window since that day. No. How did you know... I saw you in the film. What? I didn't know it was you at the time, but you are there briefly at the window, and then the camera moves down to your husband. 
Look, um, I know this is traumatic, but this is a print of the cop in the film. Would you please look at it? Yes, that is him. But why did he kill Roger? I don't know. But I'm going to make it my business to find out. I should be able to put together a strong enough case to reopen the file. <laughs> They'll say you're hysterical. Mm, all pregnant. <laughs> well, if you are pregnant, I hope you make a better job of it than I did. What do you mean? Do you know, I've hardly left the house since Roger's death. Bernard was raised by Roger's parents. But sometimes they would bring him to see me at weekends. Where did they stay? In Drancy. Bernard grew up in the same house as his father. He was always asking me to go out there with him, but I couldn't bring myself to. Not even when he started working on his father's book. Your husband wrote a book? Hmm. It was just a local history of Drancy. He started it not long before he died. Hmm. And when Bernard found it in the attic a few months ago, he wanted to try and finish it. He asked me to go with him to the places in the book and tell him what they might have meant to his father, but I couldn't bring myself to go back there. You don't happen to have a copy I could take with me now, do no, you? No, I'm sorry. Uh, perhaps Claudine will know where the manuscript is. Well, is it important? I, I could call her now, if you like. No, please, not to worry. Oh. I'm seeing her this evening. I would like to go through Bernard's desk, if I may. Mm -hmm. Among other things, mm -hmm. perhaps the manuscript is there. And thank you for seeing me. Morning, sir. Morning. You're here bright and early? Couldn't sleep, so I thought I might as well come in. What's that you've got? Ah, uh, something Claudine gave me. Gave you? When was this? Oh, did I not mention? I had dinner with her in Paris last night. Played that one close to your chest. So what's the book? It's a project that Roger Thiro started and Bernard decided to finish for him. It's a history of where they grew up in Drancy. Drancy? Meant to be a bit rough, isn't it? Nothing like as bad as it was in the early 40s, I can tell you. Gangsters? Nazis. Troncy was the transit camp for Jews being deported to the concentration camps. According to Tiro's records, 76,000 men, women and children were held here on their way to Auschwitz. They deported about 3,000 people a week. And there were only four German guards and a few French auxiliary staff. Can you believe it? Only four guards and no one ever did anything about it? Mm. To think, you could probably see the Eiffel Tower from there. Listen to this. There's a copy of a memo from the German Catering Corps in 1943 about the first convoy of toddlers to Auschwitz. Hmm. It's a Polito's breakdown of milk consumption by age group. 3,223.5 litres per month. Due to ever-fluctuating numbers... This assessment provides only an approximate listing. The number of children may vary by plus or minus 50 units per day. Units? They called the children units? How can that be? I will never understand it, Bill Sorry to disturb you, sir, but this letter just arrived for you from Paris by courier. Thank you. Now we are getting somewhere. Bill give me your lighter. What are you doing? Getting rid of the evidence. This is political dynamite. No point in Dalbois getting the sack for doing the right thing, now is there? What I don't get about Dalbois' theory is why would a police officer kill a civilian like that? It's me. All his letter said was that in 1961, Pierre Caz was a member of the Special Brigade. Now, they were responsible for liquidating Arab instigators during the Algerian War. <sighs> so far, we've not turned up one shred of evidence to suggest that Roger Thiro was involved with Algerian terrorists. No. 
Well, let's just hope our Monsieur Kaz is feeling chatty. Now, you really think he's going to tell us? Why would he walk straight out of retirement into a prison sentence? He's got nothing to lose. There was a special decree in July 1962. It gave immunity from prosecution to all those involved in covert activities during the Algerian crisis. Mm. Maybe he's proud of what he did for his country. Who knows? Maybe he's even got one of Rosnail's photos over the mantelpiece. You have just heard part two of Murder Repeats Itself by Melanie Garrett. Adapted from the novel Murder in Memoriam by Didier Danix. Heard in the cast today, Jimmy Chisel as Inspector Cardin. Mark McDonald as Burrasso. James Bryce as Rosner. Alec Heggie as Kaz. Joanna Tope as Madame Thiro. Emma Curry as Claudine. And Finley McLean as Dubois. The play was directed in London at the BBC by Bruce Young. Next time, in our concluding episode, Cardin and Borisso finally come face to face with the man in the photograph. We are investigating the events of 17th October 1961. We'd like to talk to you about why you killed Roger Thiroux. After all these years... How did you find me? A Belgian TV crew caught the whole thing on film. This is you in the photo, isn't it? <laughs> it is. You can't prosecute me. Well, we are completely out of our jurisdiction. We shouldn't even presume to ask. But Tiro's son was murdered a few days ago in Toulouse. So we're now looking into the family history. His son? I can assure you I had nothing oh, to do... Don't worry, with... Monsieur Caz. We know that already. But what we don't understand is why you killed his father. But that shooter is only the first part of their immediate problem, the murder of Bernard Thiroux. Be with us for the complete solution. The is Bill Howell. Our coordinating producer is Barry Morgan. I'm Bob Boving. Thanking you for listening and inviting your comments. See you next week. Our serial currently is Murder Repeats Itself, adapted by Melanie Garrett from the novel by Didier Danix, Murder in Memoriam. It all happens in France in 1985. A crime in Toulouse starts a trail that leads to Paris and events that occurred 20 years earlier. As we begin the concluding episode, here's what led us to this stage. The victim's name is Bernard Thiroux. He was shot twice from the front and then six more times in the back. Local residents reported the shots and our boys found the body when they arrived. Shot eight times in broad daylight? There must have been witnesses. Uh, none, but I've got uniforms out there looking for the murder weapon. Okay, so what else do we know about the victim? Um, he's a student from Paris. Born on the 20th of December, 1961. Which makes him, what, 24? Yeah. So, if he's from Paris, what was he doing getting killed all the way down here in Toulouse? There are other peculiarities about this shooting. For instance... Thiro was shot twice from the front at close range, then six more times in the back while he lay on the ground. It's a bit OTT, don't you think? Well, perhaps in the heat of the... No. 
A pro would take one shot to the head or the heart and be done with it. None of this bang, 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 cowboy-style shootout. Whoever shot Bernard Thiroux felt very strongly about wanting him dead. However, Bernard Thiroux wasn't alone in the South. He had a traveling companion from Paris, a girl named Claudine. Bernard moved in with me about six months ago. But he would often go off on his own and stay out all night. Any idea why? Depression. It's in his family. His father was killed during a riot in Paris not long before Bernard was born. And his mother never recovered. She still completely has banned. I see. So, what was Bernard doing at the municipal archives? Researching. He's a historian. Researching what? Some secret project of his. But as a visitor to the city, who would even know he was there? Or that he had a secret project? We have reason to believe the killer may have followed you from Paris. And the question we keep coming back to is... Why? From Paris? Again, we can't be certain, but we're working on this assumption for the moment. There's something I meant to ask you yesterday. You said that Bernal's father was killed during a street riot. Was he a rioter or a policeman? Um, well, definitely not a policeman anyway. His name was Roger Thiroux, and he was a history teacher. In Paris, Inspector Cardin visits Madame Thiroux, the mother of the victims. First, her husband in the Battle of Paris, and now her son on a street in Toulouse. I'm grateful to you for coming, Inspector. I can't imagine how difficult this has been for you, Madame Thiroux. Uh, First your husband, and now your son. Yes, thank you. When I made this appointment, I wanted to talk about Bernard, but since then, something has come to light. About Bernard? About the 17th of October, 1961. How can that possibly help you? I was hoping it might help you. His news centers around the film that Rosner has uncovered, and exactly what Cardin has seen in it. You are there, briefly, at the window, and then the camera moves down to your husband. Look, um, I know this is traumatic, but this is a print of the cop in the film. Would you please look at it? Yes, that is him. But why did he kill Roger? I don't know. But I'm going to make it my business to find out. Next day, back at police headquarters in Toulouse. Morning, sir. Morning. You're here bright and early? Couldn't sleep, so I thought I might as well come in. What's that you've got? Uh, something Claudine gave me. Gave you? When was this? Oh, did I not mention I had dinner with her in Paris last night. Did that one close to your chest? So what's the book? It's a project that Roger Thiroux started and Bernard decided to finish for him. It's a history of where they grew up in Drancy. Drancy? Meant to be a bit rough, is it? Nothing like as bad as it was in the early 40s, I can tell you. Gangsters? Nazis. Drancy was the transit camp for Jews being deported to the concentration camps. Sorry to disturb you, sir, but this letter just arrived for you from Paris by courier. Thank you. Now we are getting somewhere. Bougasol, give me your lighter. What are you doing? Getting rid of the evidence. This is political dynamite. No point in Dalbois getting the sack for doing the right thing. Now is there? So, a name has been uncovered, and there is a definite target. The chase heats up. You know, what I don't get about Dubois' theory is why would a police officer kill a civilian like that? It's me. All his letter said was that in 1961, Pierre Caz was a member of the Special Brigade, and they were responsible for liquidating Arab instigators during the Algerian War. So far, we've not turned up one shred of evidence to suggest that Roger Tiro was involved with Algerian terrorists. No. Well, let's just hope our Monsieur Kaz is feeling chatty. And now, the conclusion of Murder Repeats Itself. Nice shot, Monsieur Kaz. Thank you. Monsieur Cadin. Inspector Cadin. And this is Sergeant Bourassol. Sure. Mm. Well, I uh, 
I hate to interrupt the game of bull, so I'll come right to the point. We are investigating the events of 17th October 1961. We'd like to talk to you about why you killed Roger Thiroux. Yes, after all these years. How did you find me? A Belgian TV crew caught the whole thing on film. This is you in the photo, isn't it? <laughs> it is. You can't prosecute me. We are completely out of our jurisdiction. We shouldn't even presume to ask. But Tiro's son was murdered a few days ago in Toulouse. So we're now looking into the family history. Son? I can assure you I had nothing oh, to do with... Don't worry, Monsieur Caz. We know that already. But what we don't understand is why you killed his father. Oh, dear. Inspector, would you mind if we, we sat down? You see, you have to understand it was all such a long time ago, October 1961. I was part of the special brigade, taking care of things which needed doing, things which officially never happened. You mean state-sanctioned executions? You don't approve, Sergeant. It's not for us to judge. We are just trying to understand what happened. Well, what you have to understand is that we were at war with Algeria. I did my duty. I didn't lose any sleep over it. We did what we could to prevent terrorist attacks and save innocent lives. So, how does Tiro fit in? Was he involved in Algerian terrorism? Is that why you shot him during the riot, to well, send a message? I chose the riot purely because the general confusion gave me excellent cover. As to whether or not Tiro was a terrorist, I have no idea. My orders arrived in an unmarked envelope, same as usual. I didn't ask questions. I got the job done. So, who gave the orders? They came straight from the head of Special Brigade, André Villeux. Any idea of where he is now? Oh, he's had a glittering career. He's been running the criminal investigation department in Paris. But now he's just another old man like me. He's about to join the ranks of the retired. Well, monsieur, you've been a tremendous help, but we don't want to take up your whole day. Yeah, so, so, so. Not so fast, Inspector. I insist that you join me for a drink before you leave. <laughs> I'll go and get the pasties while you two warm up. Uh, warm up? For our tournament. I've saved you hours of legwork. The least you can do is indulge an old man with a game of bull. Huh? <laughs> it's a deal, monsieur. Here, Borisol, help me mark out the starting line more clearly, would you? We don't want any cheating. Sergeant, I can't believe you won again. If I'd known you were a ringer, I'd never have accepted your challenge. Ah, <laughs> yeah, my wife, back from shopping. Sergeant, I think the lady could use some assistance. Right, yeah. I'll just go and give her a hand. Well, monsieur, I guess we've taken up enough of your time. You mean that I have taken up enough of yours? <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, but it has been a pleasure. Yeah, there, there is one more thing before you go. You want us to come back and tell you what happens when we find Veyu? Uh, yes, uh, yes, but uh, be careful, Inspector. Don't be fooled by appearances. Andre Veyu could be an extremely dangerous enemy. Do you know, his wife told me the old man's only got a few months to live. No. Yeah? He seemed fitter than us. Well, he's not. And drinking is a definite no-no. She was not happy about that pastis. I wondered why he didn't touch it.
Boss, mm -hmm. you seen the cellar tape? You're not coming unstuck on me, are you, Bonasol? <laughs> now, I want to hang up this new map the stationery office has sent over. Hmm. Brighten the place up a bit? Uh, ah, here. Catch. Ah. Well, Bonasol, assuming you've no objections while you're playing at arts and crafts, I might just pop out and keep working on that double murder inquiry that's been around our necks. Fine by me, boss. Where are you going, anyway? Back to the archives to another look at those files Bernal consulted. It's just a hunch, but I wonder if we might find some reference to this André Veilloux. Oh, yeah. Nearly forgot about that. So, you reckon the initials A.V. we found in the deportation records could stand for André Veilloux? Uh, well, yes, yes, as a matter of fact, I do. Makes sense, I guess. Like the old guy said, as head of the special brigade, where you must have issued the order to execute Roger Thiro. But the question is why? And what was the connection to Bernard Thiro? Apart from the fact that they were father and son. You never even met each other, though. But they were both digging around in the murky history of Bronze. Eh? That's where the deportees all ended up before being sent to Auschwitz. If the A.V. who initialled all those deportation papers is the same A.V. who ordered the hit on Roger T. Rowe, then it all fits. We know where V.U. was in 1961, so all we need to know is... Where was he in 1942? I think it's time we gave Dalbois a quick call to see if he can check V.U.'s service record. Well, you could just ask the old guy. Huh. Fancy another game of bull, do you? Yeah, actually. But I meant the other old guy. Hmm? You know, the one at the library. What makes you think Le Cousson knows Veilloux? Well, they're both about to retire, so if Veilloux was here in Toulouse at some point, their paths may have crossed. Hmm. Well, it's possible, I suppose. Ah, there. Does this map look straight to you? Hmm? Ah, it makes a difference having all the up-to-date routes right in front of us. Next time we go up to Paris, we should try this new A-10. Maybe the restaurants will be a little better. <laughs> Bulrasol! That is it! It is? Well, think about it. Which petrol stations did you call to find the Renault sedan? My God, you're right. Uh -huh. I just assumed he would take the main motorway. But he could have taken this new road. Mind you, it'd taken him a bit longer. Mm, but discretion might have been more important to him than speed. Oh, I'll get right on it. Start calling all the petrol stations from scratch. I'm sorry, boss. I can't believe I've missed something so obvious. Not to worry, Bullsall. It happens to the best of us at times. <laughs> It's Kadar here. I'm outside the archives and I've got what we need. Listen, have you got any plans for this evening? No, not really. Excellent. Delbois is expecting us in Paris. Uh, can you come and pick me up? Yeah, okay. But what did that like son have to say? What the... Sir? What is it? I don't believe it. It's like who saw. He just took a shot at me. What? Kadar! Kadar, can you hear me? Don't worry about me, Bullasol. I've dodged straighter bullets than he was firing, I can tell you. Why did he try and shoot you? To stop me from having him arrested and sent away for a very long time. You're joking. The only joke here is him. First he fainted, then when he came to, he just lay there whimpering like a child. But fortunately for him, I'm a much better shot than he is. He'll limp for a while, but he'll live. Now, uh, where is the car? Back at the station. I came on foot. I thought it would be faster. Well, well, well. I see Les Cousins' Wild West stunt really had you going there, eh, Bourassol? Saw my life flashing before your eyes, did you? Worried about how you could live without me? You can tell me all about it on our drive to Paris. Well, you still haven't told me why we're even going to Paris. To make the big arrest in our double homicide case, Bourassol. Assuming that's all right with you. You haven't got plans, have you? Something on the telly, maybe? André? André Veilloux. 
I am arresting you for the murder of Bernard Thiroux and conspiracy to murder Roger Thiroux. Borosso, get the cuffs on him. Uh, not so fast. Trust me, Inspector. Bringing conspiracy to murder charges against someone who has complete immunity from prosecution is not the best way of advancing one's career. The immunity from prosecution extends to servants of the state who are conducting legitimate anti-terrorist activities. I'll double-check the statute, but somehow I don't think carrying out personal vendettas to hide your collaborationist past is going to qualify. You'll have more than that to hide from once your case comes to court. The press will be dining out on you for years. Oh, come now, Sergeant. None of this will ever come to court. None of this will ever make it to any newspaper. Yeah, right, whatever. Now turn around and face the wall. After Les Cossons' embarrassing little shooting spree, I had no choice but to make a few calls. Right this minute of the ministry, they are preparing a version of events which will be more palatable to public expectation of French law and order. I said face the wall. Inspector... Why don't you call the minister yourself? Uh, please, use my phone. That won't be necessary. Stand down, Gourassol. Sir, can't be true. I'm afraid it can. Still, you are to be congratulated on a fine investigation. If nothing else, you did manage to bring my retirement forward by three months, for which I extend my heartfelt gratitude. I hope I am not interrupting. <sighs> Kaz? What are you doing here? Taking him out of the equation before he does the same to you. Kaz? No! I got him. You've killed him! You want to beat a man like V.U., you, you play by his rules. But you must have known your immunity wouldn't extend to this. Who of us is ever truly immune, Inspector? You will play uh, another bottle of champagne when you've got a moment. Ah. Uh, my treat. Nice way to round off the meal, and I think we deserve it, don't you? Most definitely. You know, Dalbois, we could not have done it without you. Oh, I'm sure you would have got there in the end. Just might have taken a little longer. Mm. I'm still not even sure I understand everything that's happened. Bureaucratic excellence at its worst. That's what happened. In 1942, Veyu was in charge of Jewish affairs in the Toulouse area. He was responsible for deporting record numbers of Jewish children to death camps. André Bayou is a Nazi. Worse. He wasn't acting out of political conviction. He was the consummate civil servant just following orders. But then why did Le Cousin try to shoot you? Again, the answer goes back to 1942. Le Cousin was Veilloux's clerical assistant. Oh, they made a formidable team. When Le Cousin realized that Roger Thiroux was about to expose them, he told Veilloux, who then gave Pierre Caz the order to eliminate him. But Bernard's father was only a child during the war. He couldn't possibly have known what was going on. A child, yes, but a child from Drancy, who grew up and decided to write the history of his town. When he realized the numbers of children deported from Toulouse was higher than elsewhere in France, he made a special trip down south to consult the archives. Just as his son would do more than 20 years later. Mm. Only this time, Veilloux wasn't in a position to order a hit, so he was forced to drive to Toulouse to do it himself. So, what will happen to Kasner? He'll be arraigned this afternoon. The family's health is so bad that it's unlikely he'll live until the trial. If you don't mind, sir, I'd like to go to the arraignment before we head back to Toulouse. I'm sure he'll appreciate that, Bourassol. But I'm afraid you'll have to make your way back to Toulouse without me. I have one or two things to attend to here in Paris, so I'll get the train down in a few days. In that case, if you'll excuse me, I think I'll head over to the court to see what's happening. Any chance of a lift? Oh, sure. But here comes the champagne. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure you'll manage without us somehow. <laughs> and shall we drink to? To public outrage. I'm sorry? Oh, just think of the furore there will be when the press gets started on this story. Even the best laid cover-ups can only last for so long. Mm, just don't get your hopes up too high. France is still France. What's that supposed to mean? Look, I'm not supposed to say anything, but Veilloux was right. 
I've already been ordered to seal our case files. But his body isn't even cold yet. How can you accept that? Surely you must see that, that by ignoring our past, we're condemning ourselves to relive it. Actually, that's something I learned from a pair of dead historians. Their murders were rooted in the history of France herself, which is, of course, my history too. So what are you going to do about it? just heard the conclusion of Murder Repeats Itself by Melanie Garrett, adapted from the novel Murder in Memoriam by Didier Danix. Heard in the cast, Jimmy Chisel as Inspector Cardin, Mark McDonald as Bourassa, James Bryce as Rosner, Alec Heggie as Kaz, Robert Trotter as André Vieux, Joanna Tope as Madame Thiro, Emma Curry as Claudine, and Finley McLean as Dubois. Used to be. And today we also begin a three part series, Dr. Johnson Investigates. It's by Richard Brayshaw. It takes us back to London, 1776. And our hero is the famous lexicographer, Dr. Samuel Johnson, aided by his friend and biographer, James Boswell. It's kind of a, well, kind of a Watson Holmes matchup. The action begins with Jane Boswell holding forth in a coffee house. And soon you'll hear the voice of Leo McKern, starring as the roly poly Dr. Johnson. And the topic of discussion is that play, the Scottish play, you know, the one I can't say the name of. Banquo's murderer discovered by Samuel Johnson, Doctor of Laws, and his companion, James Boswell. Had any man in London propounded this fantasy a month ago, I'd have called him mad or drunk. Yet today, the talk in the coffee houses is of nothing else. How my distinguished friend Dr. Johnson brought to light one infamous murder and prevented another is the subject of universal admiration. I should uh, flatter myself were I to claim any credit for this achievement. Nevertheless, I believe I was to some degree of assistance to him. And my concern now is to record, while they are fresh in my memory, the singular events that have plagued Mr. Garrick and the Theatre Royal Drury Lane during the past week. It began one evening at the Somerset Coffee House in the Strand. I remember Dr. Johnson was expatiating about the theatre and upon his friend and former pupil, David Garrick. Why, sir, artifice, artifice and experience. The actor must employ artifice, yet the passions he portrays must spring from human experience. You mean, Johnson, that the actor must truly feel the emotions expressed? By no means, Bossy. He must counterfeit, he must imitate, but... That imitation springs from nature. This is the actor's craft. Art and nature. A modicum of both and a preponderance of neither. Just so, sir. <laughs> there are some players, accomplished ones too, who become so adept at counterfeiting that they cannot distinguish between what is true and what is fictitious. <laughs> Fact and fantasy become so commingled in their minds that they pass from one to the other unawares. You may converse with them for an hour at a time without discovering their real feelings. For example, sir, even now, conspiracy, regicide, and armed insurrection are impending on the stage at Brewery Lane. <laughs> but who is to comprehend what hidden passions truly activate the protagonist? Exactly, Bozzy. For all we know, Macbeth may be more exercised in his mind by the payment of his tailor than <laughs> by the murder of the King of Scotland. <laughs> Come along, gentlemen. On stage, please. You know Mr. Garrick hates on punctuality. Hook me up with the fact, Finney. There's a dear. 
What's the house like tonight? Oh, packed to the roof, my dear. And all come to see you. Oh, of course, Benny. Oh, can't you see the critics' eulogies? Sarah Siddons' performance called for universal admiration. In the banquet scene, she consumed moldy bread and cold tea with the utmost conviction. And her five lines as the second apparition in Act 4 evoked rapturous applause. Have patience, dearie. You'll be famous one day. Oh, I wish Mr. Garrick would, sir. One of these days, Mr. Garrick's going to eat his words. You'll see. Which is on stage, please? To your places, gentlemen. Everyone ready, please? Quiet, everybody, quiet. Curtain going up. When shall we three meet again? In thunder, lightning, or in rain? When the hurly burl is done? When the battle... I'd be obliged, Mr. Barry, if you'd give me the correct cue this evening. I'd be obliged, Mr. Warburton, if you'd keep your correct position. You walked upstage with me last That time. is untrue. You call me a liar. You moved downstage. You did it deliberately. You can't deny it. I am not answerable to you, sir. You would prefer to answer to Mr. Garrick. Oh, Mr. Garrick, Mr. Garrick. We all know who his toadies are. Do you refer to me, Mr. Barry? Gentlemen, gentlemen, quiet, please. The audience will hear you. Garrick is a master of his craft, sir. He has advanced the dignity of his profession. He's a very sprightly writer, too. And all this supported by great wealth of his own acquisition. If all this had happened to me, I should have had a couple of fellows with long poles walking before me to knock down everybody that stood in the way. <laughs> Yet, Garrick speaks to us, Fossey. Oh, he's a very good man. A charitable man. No, nay more. A liberal man. He's given away more money than any man in England. There may be a little vanity mixed, but he has shown that money is not his first object. Yet Foot used to say of him that uh, he walked out intending to do a generous action, but turning the corner of a street, he met with the ghost of a hickney, which frightened him. <laughs> <laughs> Why, sir, that's very true, too. I... I remember drinking tea with him long ago. Peg Woffington made it, and he grumbled at her for making it too strong. <laughs> ah, he then begun to feel money in his purse and didn't know when he should have enough of it. Uh, he has enough now, sir. There's no question. Oh, he has much money, but not enough. No man ever had enough. You're pleased to be cynical, sir. No, sir. Voracious. If money purchased freedom from care, Davy would be a happy man. But he has his worries. I hear there are troubles in the company. Oh, there are always troubles in the company. Players are contentious folk. Barry, for instance, there's an overweening room. Oh, they say Spranger Barry's a fine Macbeth. Oh, well, that we shall judge for ourselves tomorrow night. Come, we must be stir ourselves. It's nearly nine o'clock. Davy promised to meet us at the Prince's Tavern after he'd seen the curtain rise. Barry, this is too much. Last night the wrong cue, and tonight you've cut my final speech completely. A trifling error, Warburton. I always forget the naked frailty of speech. I can't think why. That's a lie, sir. You did it on purpose. I find it hard to concentrate, sir, when I'm being upstaged. After all, I am the lead. Oh, you admit it was deliberate? I admit nothing of the sort. Now, kindly withdraw. You know this is my quick change. I'll not be dismissed, sir. I demand an apology. Mr. Warburton, sir, I am inexpressibly grieved by the loss of your immortal speech. Had you as many lines as you have hairs, I would not wish them a fairer death. Now, pray excuse me. You're pleased to be flippant, sir. I see you're determined to provoke me. The provocation is yours, sir. You presume on your reputation as a swordsman. You want a pretext, don't you? You seek by challenge so that you have a choice of weapons. Why should I quarrel with you? As to that, Mr. Warburton, you know best. <laughs> Professional jealousy, perhaps? Oh, no, sir. I know an inferior actor when I see one. <laughs> well said, sir. And isn't the mirror your worst enemy? Then it must be personal jealousy. What do you mean by that? I mean, sir, your attitude to my wife. What of your wife, Mr. Barry? She does not relish your odious attentions. Do you accuse me? I am not accusing, Mr. Warburton. I am after stating a fact. So it's a letter you are, a goat. 
A fumbler with other men's wives. Oh, your wife flatters herself. I've no great desire to catch the pop. Why, you... You, I take it, are less fastidious. Why, you damn scoundrel. <laughs> Never take your soul. Is that good enough for you? Thank you, Mr. Barry. That will do admirably. My seconds will call upon you. Mr. Barry, Mr. Warburton, please. On stage, Act 3, Scene 1. Mr. Barry and Mr. Warburton, please. Johnson, she said, you smell. No, madam, I replied, you smell. I stink. <laughs> oh, Davy, Davy, Davy. You have a February face. What a miss. You may well ask. There's been more trouble with Rafferty. I've had to dismiss him. We'll have a new property master on Monday. Rafferty, is, is he the one He's who... the uh, one who drinks, uh, yes. Hmm. He was blind drunk last night. Set the wrong goblet in the banquet scene. I had a special one made, you see, with a square base so it wouldn't roll. Yeah. Rafferty sets one with a round base. In comes Banquo's ghost, sprang a hurls down the cup, it rolls down stage, bounces over the footlights and cuts the eye of a footman standing in the pit. And what was Spranger's next line? Tell me that. Ah, I know it, Davy. Thou hast no speculation in those eyes which thou dost glare with. <laughs> exactly. And the whole house roars. <laughs> oh, confound Rafferty. Confound Macbeth. There are times when I hate it. Oh, for shame, Davy. Tis a noble play. It's a damned unlucky one, and there's an end on it. Consider this week. A drunken property master, George Warburton, and his gallantries, Tom and Meg Blunt fighting like the Kilkenny cats. And nothing but, but, but quarrels, fightings, tantrums and jealousies. Where's it all going to end? Tom, you must leave the dressing room. I'll not quarrel with you during the play. How, how can I give a performance when I'm upset? Devil take it, madam. A man has a right to know where his wife's been all day. I've told you. I was at the market. Mm. Then I walked in the park. Alone? Yes, Tom, Alone. Then I came straight here to the theatre. Hmm. And I must starve while you take your solitary walks <sighs> abroad. Hmm. What of your duty to your husband? What, sir, of your duty to your wife? How dare you mention that again? Just you listen to me. No, Tom, you listen to me. I've had enough of your tantrums and jealousies. You can do as you please. Spend your time drinking with your cronies and playing cards with George Warburton with no thought for me. I must sit in our lodgings awaiting your beck and call. Well, I'll endure it no longer. But for my wife. I'm an actress in my own right. I'm not just Mrs. Blunt. You know very well Mr. Garrick engaged you only because you're my husband. That's a lie, madam. A monstrous lie. Bad life. I was playing lead when you were wearing pinafores. I need no assistance from you. You make that very plain. It's not a wife you require, but a slave. Well, I'll not be treated like that. Once and for all, no. Oh, oh, let me go. You're hurting my arms. Listen, listen to what I say, woman. Tom, Tom! Are you coming? Oh, forgive me. I didn't mean to intrude. It's all right, George. Tom and I have finished our little talk. Uh, go on, Tom. You mustn't keep the cards waiting, must you? As you please, madam. We'll discuss it later. Yes. Come on, George. Now then, listen. End of the intermission, ladies and gentlemen. End of the intermission. Act four, please. Act four. End of the intermission. Playing very small tonight, Mr. Payne. Damn me, Warburton. I have no option. Right, gentlemen. Uh -huh. This turn wins. Mm -hmm. And it's... Good God. Oh, damned hard luck, Payne. Nine of hearts. Oh, that's a sovereign for Blunt. Oh, thank you. Uh, two shillings from pain. Hmm. You have the devil's own luck, blood. <laughs> you are lucky in cards and in love, eh, Tom? Yes. <laughs> oh, what's the matter? Look like you've seen a ghost. It's nothing, George. Nothing. I. Oh, you will? No, no, I'm all right. Uh, oh, come on, make haste. Pain's on stage in a few minutes' time. Aye, ah, so he is. Well, here's your chance, Mr. Pain. Last four cards in the case. Bottom one's in hock. Call for the next three? No, thank you. Oh, come on, man. Don't forget, the house pays four to one. Mm. If I win, and takes five to one if I lose. Oh, come, to be a man. Faint heart, never one fairer. Warburton, how much am I in? Uh, hmm, let's see. I've got the reckoning here somewhere. 
Mr. Payne, <laughs> you could see for yourself. It, it wasn't on display. That's what I don't understand. Do you accuse Warburton of dishonesty? Do you call him a cheat, sir? I don't know. Oh, God. Oh, come, Mr. Payne, this won't do. A gentleman pays his gambling debts. Well, what am I to do? You, you'll have to accept a note. A word of warning, Mr. Payne. The last time I had to employ debt collectors... They went about the business rather clumsily, indeed, brutally. An actor whose face is his fortune wouldn't want anything to do with them, I assure you. I'm broke, I tell you. Mr. Early, Mr. Payne, Mr. Douglas on stage, please. Oh. For Act 5, Scene 2. Mr. Early, Mr. Payne, Mr. Douglas, please. Act 5, Scene 2. Let's discuss it in the morning, Mr. Payne. Don't miss your call. You, you must excuse me, gentlemen. Mm, of course. <laughs> oh, oh, poor oh. little Mr. Payne, a lamb to the slaughter. <laughs> Don't push him too hard, you. I'm not, he'll pay. God, he must. <laughs> there are precious few chickens left to be plucked in this company. <sighs> and what will poor Robin do then, poor thing? Why, then we go elsewhere. What do you say to Bath or Dublin? Mm, wherever you like. So long as we split, 50-50. 50-50 it is, Tom, as always. Drinks, winnings, women. Ah. We've always played fair with each other. That is, until you got married. Uh, we can still share drinks and winnings, don't we? Aye, so we can. <laughs> 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 ah, do you never wonder, Tom, why Duncan and Banco get murdered so early in the play? No, George. Why? I said that they can relieve young Mr. Payne of his hard-won cash at Pharaoh. <laughs> the lines must flow. They must roll off the tongue. Shakespeare wrote in verse, not in prose. You're very true, Davy, but he also wrote sense. And the sense is as important as the sound. But the player's first purpose is to please the ear. The players, sir, have got a kind of rant with which they run on without any regard either to accent or emphasis. Oh, come, Johnson, this is to deny them intelligence. I simply affirm that actors are creatures of habit. There is a tradition of declaiming lines which they accept slavishly without thought for the significance of what is spoken. You're pleased to be sarcastic. Well, now, I'll give you something to speak. Uh, with which you're little acquainted. <laughs> then we shall see how just my observation is. That shall be the criterion. Let me hear you repeat the ninth commandment. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Now come, Bossy, you first. Oh. Oh. Why, uh, uh, it is perfectly simple. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Yeah, so, now, Davy. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Oh, very fine, very rhythmical. But where's the sense? Well, the sense is obvious. Aye, but it needs emphasis. Now, what are the significant words? They are not and false witness. The line must be, thou shalt not bear 
false witness against thy neighbor. Rhythm must defer to sense. That's very true, sir. Isn't it so, Jacob? I'll make a bargain with you. Do you not advise me on the dramatic art, and I'll not write a dictionary? <laughs> well said, Davy. Let the cobbler keep to his last. Well, shall we see you tomorrow night? Aye. We'll meet here at the Prince's Tavern after the performance. There are two seats for you in the circle. Bates will attend to you. We look forward to the play with anticipation. I hope you won't be disappointed. Uh, tell me, uh, David, how is your new juvenile faring? Oh, buddy. The little sittings. Oh, there's another bad bargain. Oh, they say she's very beautiful. Well, maybe. But she'll never make an actress. Good night, David. Mm -hmm. He's in a black mood tonight. A man whose fortune depends on popular acclaim stands ever on the edge of a precipice. Mm. <laughs> he didn't take kindly to your instruction. <laughs> Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. <laughs> actors and clergymen, Bozzy, actors and clergymen, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. <laughs> Mrs. Blunt, I'll not be spoken to like that. It's all fitted perfect. It doesn't fit now. You'll have to alter it. I can't go altering costumes every day. You'll have to do it yourself. You're the wardrobe mistress. It's your job. When I made that costume a month ago, it was a perfect fit. You said so yourself. It's you. What's put on weight? Damn your eyes, you stupid old cow. Oh. Well, really. Whatever next. Twenty years in the business and no one ever spoke to me like that before. Oh. Hello, Vinny. All finished for tonight? Oh, oh, just about, Miss Sarah. Oh, what's the matter? You look upset. Well, it's that Mrs. Blunt. I don't know what's come over her. She comes raging in here. Binny, you stupid bitch, she says. What have you done to my costume? It doesn't fit, she says. What well, a proper stat she was. Well, it's nothing to do with me. I ain't touched her costume. Oh, she's not herself. She's got something on her mind. Well, I must, son. There's no way to carry on. After all, everyone's got their trouble. Oh, well, don't be too upset, Binny. Oh. I'm sure she didn't mean it. She'll be round first thing tomorrow to apologise. Just you see. <laughs> Well, Garrick certainly can't complain about the takings. There isn't an empty seat. Oh, Macbeth is a popular play, sir. And sprang a Barry as his adherents. Well, we shall soon see if he deserves their loyalty. Here they come to illuminate the footlights. Uh, how far that little candle throws his beams. So, so shines a good deed in a naughty world. <laughs> in good voice tonight. Aye, sir, he has the grand manner. He has an air of command. But his performance lacks sensitivity. Oh, it's scarcely surprising. Davy claims that Macbeth's an impossible part to perform. In what respect? Why, sir, he's several characters all rolled into one. He's a successful soldier and so impervious to human suffering. Yet... He is also a poet, a man of sentiment and sentiments. He sees visions. He has scruples. He lacks the singleness of purpose exhibited by his wife. The visionary and the man of action are scarcely reconcilable. Well, sir, I played the role when I was at university. It never presented me with any difficulty. <laughs> Why, Buzzy, that says much for your command of the histrionic art. Hmm. So we must tell Davy that his doubts are unfounded. Hmm. <laughs> almost a mile. But he does usually, so all men do. From hence to the palace gate, make it their wall. A light! A light! Did he? Stand to it. It will be rain tonight. Let it come down! Oh, treachery! Oh! Oh! Who did strike out the light? Stop the way. There's the one down. The sun is set. We have lost this half of our affair. Well, let's 
away and say how much is done. Oh, well, Marty. What do you think of that? I thought it was a most unconvincing scene. Oh, yet, Warburton's well, a good actor. <laughs> Who ever saw a murdered man fall like that? He toppled over like a tree. Oh, have you ever seen a man murdered, sir? Uh, well, no, sir, but uh, I never saw it done like that on the stage before. And uh, there was there was a pause, as if, uh, as if someone had missed a line. You are right, sir. Banquo bids Friance escape and revenge. <laughs> he must have forgotten. Something's amiss, Posse. See, Davy's coming through the curtains. Ladies and gentlemen, I beg your indulgence. There has been a mishap. Mr. Warburton has suffered an injury. Ladies and gentlemen, quiet, please. Quiet. I beg you. Come, Marty. We must go behind the scenes. Davy needs help. Can't believe it, Forbes. I just can't believe it. Clear the stage, please, ladies and gentlemen. Come on, Mr. Blunt. Please clear the stage. I was talking to him only half an hour ago, and oh, he's dead. Come into the green room. Carefully now. Just stand back there, please, ladies and gentlemen. Clear the stage. You're quite sure he's dead, folks? Yes, sir. No doubt about it. Where's Rafferty? Has anyone seen Rafferty? He was on stage a few minutes well, ago. Find him. All of you. Search the theatre from cellar to roof. And never... Off with you. Oh. Time your body. Almighty God, what a calamity. Did you see it happen? I gave him a choice. I did. It was the third mother. Who plays the part? Rafferty. Now he's disappeared. He's here. He's here. Rafferty. Come with him. Fetch a light, someone. Over here. Under the staircase. Here he is, sir. I'm going to the wardrobe. I've seen his feet sticking out. Oh, oh look. He's covered in blood. Oh, oh, oh. oh, good God. He's dead, too. No, he isn't. He twitched. He's unconscious. Let me see. Let me see. Hold the light. Now, he's intoxicated, sir. The man's insensible with drink. You're right, Johnson. Here, hold the light closer. Blood on his face and cloak. And what's this? A dagger. Here, take it, Bozzy. Oh, you must excuse me, Garrick. Uh, all this blood... I feel all together squeamish. Seen firm on purpose. Give me the dagger. Here, Forbes. Get two fellows. Have Rafferty out of there and put him in a tub of water. I want to hear what he has to say. And send for the watch. Quickly now. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, the fellow, uh, John, lend a hand. Oh, son, Bozzy. We need a drink. There's a bottle of brandy in my room. Uh, I'll come to you in a few minutes. <laughs> just heard part one of Dr. Johnson Investigates, written by Richard Brayshaw. Leo McKern starred as Dr. Johnson. You may remember Leo McKern. He was Rumpole of the Bailey, that old TV series. You also heard Edward D'Souza as James Bonswell. Uh, Boswell, that is. And you can join us next week for part two, in which Dr. Johnson tries to get to the bottom of our mysterious theatrical crime in question. The play was directed by Brian Miller, and the coordinating producer is Barry Morgan. What kind of injury could this inflict? The blade is obtunded and the end is rounded. Uh, let me see. Uh, well, this is just a, a property dagger. It's not only blunted, the blade retracts into the handle. Well, how is that? Well, it appears to go into the victim body. Here, see for yourself. Ah, how very ingenious. So, if I, if I stab the table... 
Oh. Good God. It isn't working. Give it to me. Look, Samuel, the blade's immovable. It's rusted up. So, if a man struck with sufficient force, it would transfix the victim. It would indeed. A dangerous property, Dave. Dangerous, all right. We've nearly had accidents before. Rafferty is supposed to inspect all the daggers each night to ensure that they work. And what if they don't? Why, he throws them away. He didn't throw this one away. So, Rafferty gets drunk, picks up a faulty dagger, and stabs Warburton to death. What a terrible mischance. What did I tell you? Macbeth's a confoundedly unlucky play. A disputable hypothesis, sir. How can you say that? Doesn't this prove it? Well, you, you surely don't suggest, sir, that... This was anything but an accident. I suggest nothing, sir, but certain facts mystify me. Where were you, Davy, when this accident occurred? Been here, doing the accounts. So you didn't witness the stabbing? No. Forbes fetched me after the curtain fell. But the entire audience saw it happen. Bozzy, how many times was Warburton stabbed? Once. And where was he stabbed? In the chest. In the chest, Davy. Once. What of it, Johnson? Where was Bagwell stabbed, and how often? I see. In the head. The head. I, my good lord, safe in the ditch he bides with twenty trenchant gashes on his head. In fact, I directed Rafferty to strike first between the shoulder blades, and then, when Warburton fell, the murderers closed around him and made to stab his head. But Rafferty was drunk, so he stabbed him in the chest. Rafferty was so drunk, sir, that he was unconscious. Three minutes later, how could he have struck a fatal blow? But we saw him do it. Saw whom? Why, Rafferty, to be shot. Oh, come, Johnson, we saw him quite plainly. No, sir, we did not. We saw a figure hooded and cloaked like the other two. But the dagger, the, the blood in his cloak and face, it must have been Rafferty. Oh, oh, indeed. And it must have been the groom, sir, who killed Duncan in the play. Hey, <laughs> David. Yes. Yes, indeed. I'll gild the faces of the grooms with all, for it must seem their guilt. Yeah. I shall go and talk to Forbes and Mrs. Siddons. I have some questions to ask. Yes, do so. Meanwhile, Bozzy, you and I'll take a stroll on the stage and behind the scenes. Maybe our scrutiny will offer a hint to the mystery. That observation with extensive view survey the stage... A chance to yield a clue. Marjorie, you impudent scoundrel! Will you improve my own writings for me? You're nothing better than an iconoclast, sir. <laughs> But how did you come to be in the wings, Mrs. Binion? Oh, well, sir, I, I was here in the wardrobe room minding my own business. Oh, then there was this scream. Oh, it was horrible, Dr. Johnson, horrible. Yeah. Turned my bones to a jelly. I ran out down the corridor, and there he was, in the middle of the stage, weltering in his gore. Oh, if you'll pardon the expression. Uh, uh, who else was in the wings? Oh, well, just Mrs. Siddons. Oh, and Mr. Blunt. He'd been with me in the wardrobe room. I was mending his costume. Ripped his cloak on a nail, he did. Just as he made his exit through the upstage arch. Shocking tear. Right through to his small clothes. Oh, he comes straight round to me at the end of Act One. I'll have something to say to Mr. Forbes about that archway. Uh, you, uh, you didn't perceive anyone else loitering in the wings? No, sir. Oh, of course, there was Mr. Barry and Mrs. Dancer and the rest of them over the other side. Yeah. Uh, only I couldn't see them clearly, what with my eyes and, oh, and being upset by that scream. Uh, it's, it's been a great shock. Great shock to everyone, Mrs. Binion. Terrible business, Mr. Boswell. But there you are, Macbeth again. Nothing but bad luck. And the work for wardrobe and properties you wouldn't believe. All them helmets, whiskers and red pigtails. Oh. You have an onerous responsibility, madam. The theatre is indebted to you. Oh. Uh, and so are we. Uh, now we shall bid you good night. Uh, Mr. Boswell and I will retrace our labyrinthine way to the stage. Oh, you can get out this way, sir. Oh? Uh, well, if you don't mind stepping round the ampers. Uh, through that door, straight through the property room, and there you are. Uh, 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 you, uh, uh, your servant, madam. Uh, you have been most accommodating. Oh, it's a pleasure, sir. But, Forbes, why weren't you here in the prompt corner as usual? I was underneath the stage, sir. The cord and trap's been sticking again. I... I've just gone down to inspect it. So you were holding the book, Mrs. Siddons? Yes, Mr. Garrick. Did you see what happened on stage? No, sir. I noticed that George Warburton missed his line. When I brought the curtain down, he... 
He didn't get up. He just lay there. There was blood. Real blood. I screamed. Who else was in the wings? Mr. and Mrs. Barry and the others in the banquet scene. They were on the far side. Yes, yes, of course. But, but your side, prompt side. There was no one else, sir. You're sure of that? Quite sure. When I screamed, Mr. Forbes hastened up the ladder. Then a minute or so later, I saw Binny and Mr. Blunt. I see. Well, thank you, Mrs. Siddons. Thank you. Uh, now then, Forbes. I want a statement from everyone in the company. Everyone. Where they were when Warburton was killed, who was with them, and so forth. But it was an accident, sir. How can you be so positive? Well, I, uh... Mr. Garrick, sir, you surely don't suggest it was a deliberate act. Who's to say, Mr. Forbes, until we've questioned the entire company? Let me have your report by tomorrow afternoon. As you wish, sir. Oh, and I want to inspect that cauldron trap. Now, we've trouble enough on our hands. We don't want any more. Fetch your lantern, will you? Oh, there you are, Johnson. Bosley. David? Have you, uh, have you ever been beneath the stage? No, David. There's a trap door giving trouble. Come and have a look at it. Oh. Ah, uh, this way. You'll have to take care down the ladder. Now you, Johnson. There you see, Dr. Johnson, the actor stands on this platform here yeah. and is drawn upwards by means of the pulley and drum operated by a stage hand. Ah. Right. A long haul. Oh, yes, Mr. Boswell. It's a good 15 feet. But uh, how does the actor pass through the stage floor? The trap door is immediately above us. Ah, yes. It's in, you see, and kept in place by a bolt. When I pull a rope in the prompt corner, the bolt is withdrawn and the trap falls open by its own weight. Hmm. A weight that must be considerable. Doesn't the noise interrupt the performance? We disguise it with a roll of thunder. Uh, ah, simple indeed. mechanism, I perceive. Well, what then is the dilemma? The trap doesn't always open when I draw the bolt. Uh, if you'll hold the ladder, Mr. Garrick, I'll take a closer mm. look. Go up you go, Forbes. Use the lantern. If the trap door fails to open when the bolt is withdrawn, there can be but one reason. There's been some expansion. Do you say that the wood has swollen? I mean, sir, that if the door is not infibulated by the bolt, then it must be compaginated by some tumefaction of the timbers. Ah, I, yes, I see I see what's happened, Mr. Garrick. The trap has come away from the lintel. Uh, one of the hinges is loose. Indeed, the wood's quite rotten. You must set the carpenter to it tomorrow morning. I'll instruct him to patch it up, sir. Patch it? Well, we need to put in a whole new beam. Well, why can't you do that tomorrow? We'll I'll have to strike the scenery, sir. We can't do that before Sunday. Uh, we shall make it safe until then. Now, do you promise that? Oh, yes, sir. Let's see, who, who uses this trap? Oh, only second and third apparitions in Act 4. Uh, Mrs. Siddons and Mrs. Metcalf. And what about the armed head? Uh, Hobson, isn't it? Oh, he uses the OP trap, sir. That's quite safe. Well, you must tell Mrs. Siddons and Mrs. Metcalf. You'd better warn the whole company. Yeah, yes, very good, sir. Confound all trap doors. They're always giving trouble. Now, wasn't there an accident some years ago? Oh, it was indeed. Charlie Beaumont in 64. Charles Beaumont. Trap gave way and he broke his neck. And there have been others. A gruesome thought, sir. I'm becoming a prey to morbid imaginings. Come, Bozzy. Uh, we leave Davy and Mr. Forbes to their deliberations. <laughs> oh, uh, don't forget, Davy. Uh, we dine with the Thrales tomorrow night. Uh, we shall take a carriage to Streatham. Uh, may we call for you here at uh, 7 o'clock? I'll oblige you. Good night, you both. Good night, Davy. Thank you, my friend. I've just come from the theatre. The whole company had a turmoil. Mrs. Binion had hysterics twice last night and thrice this morning. <laughs> Blunt's inconsolable at the loss of his boon companion and Rafferty is lodged in the roundhouse. He's to go before the magistrate on Monday to answer a charge of culpable homicide. Has he made any admission of guilt? Yeah, well, he, um, he admits to taking a drink in the property room. After that, he remembers nothing. Culpable homicide, so it's believed to have been a mishap. So say the watch, but there are all kinds of rumours running round the company. I believe your suspicions are justified. Oh, I suspect nothing, sir, but I question everything. You have reason, sir. 
Forbes told me in the strictest confidence he believes it was deliberate murder. Murder? By whom? You'll be astounded, sir. It was Barry. Spratt of Barry? Oh, I can't believe it. He quarreled with Warburton in his dressing room on Wednesday. Barry accused Warburton of molesting his wife and struck him. They were to fight a duel. Tomorrow morning in Hyde Park, Forbes was supposed to be Warburton's second. Barry and Warburton to fight a duel. Warburton was a formidable swordsman. He's already killed two men. Everybody knew that. So, Barry took steps to ensure that Warburton would miss the assignation in Hyde Park tomorrow morning. Exactly. Your mystery is solved. Ah, thank you. And how will you prove it? Why, Sally, it's not for me to prove it. I, of course, will uh, do my duty as a citizen. Oh, I'm, uh, I'm to take coffee with Sarah Siddons in the green room at 11 o'clock. Oh, oh. Then I shall... Yes. Uh, then I shall go to Bow Street and lodge information with the watch. They must take what action they please. Oh, Barry's a blustering fellow, to be sure. But uh, he would commit a cold-blooded murder. Now, uh, that uh, strains my credulity. <laughs> He's an Irishman, sir. So? Well... Irishmen are contentious folk. But Barry, with other compatriots of his, was ever one to promise more than he performed. He had a motive, sir. You'll not deny that. Uh, that's true. Jealousy is a strong motive for murder. No one but a lunatic ever killed without a motive. But a murderer needs something else, Bozzy. What's that? Opportunity. <laughs> he had ample opportunity. Oh, did he? Did he indeed? Study the play, Bozzy. Study the play. Then go and lodge your information at Bow Street. says your performance of Portia was exquisite, Mrs. Simmons. You're a flatterer, sir. I failed miserably. Oh, I'll not believe it, ma'am. And I wish Macbeth offered equal scope for your talents. It's an ill-starred production, Mr. Boswell, and the company's an unhappy one. People are quarrelsome and spiteful. But aren't they so in all theatrical companies? Oh, there are a few such wherever you go. But here in London, at the pinnacle, people are fighting for their existence. It's like a mountain summit. A few hardy souls have struggled to the top where they jostle and shove. Each can only keep his place by pushing someone else over the edge. The art of survival comes before the art of the theatre. Well, that's an uncomfortable thought. It has never occurred to me. You must find it disconcerting for, uh, I perceive, you're a very sensitive person. Oversensitive, Mr. Boswell. But I'm growing a lobster shell of indifference to protect me from all but the most disarming companions. Of whom I hope you'll regard me as one. If I can be of service to you at any time, I, I do hope you'll call upon me. Oh, you're very kind. I confess, I felt lonely since I came to London. Lonely and frightened. Frightened? There are undercurrents of feeling in the company. There are mishaps. Every time I step onto the cauldron trap, I fear another accident. And now, last night, it was horrible. My dear, it's but natural you should feel like this. Count on me for assistance, I beg you. Tonight, Dr. Johnson, Mr. Garrick and I are, are engaged to dine at Streatham. But tomorrow and subsequently, I am free to devote myself entirely to your interests. Should you require me. Thank you, Mr. Boswell. I'm greatly obliged to you. Snuffbox. Item a purse containing six guineas. Item a handkerchief. Have you got that, Mr. Forbes? The handkerchief? Yes, Mr. Blunt. Item a pocket knife. Item three papers, two bills, and oh, here, what's this? Now, let me see. It's no good. I, I can't endure it. George lies dead, and here we are in his dressing room, making an inventory of his possessions as if he'd never lived. 
I can't bear it anymore. You'll have to finish the job yourself. I understand, Blunt, but this note... Don't destroy it. I can't do that. It's part of his estate. Burn it. It'll only cause trouble. It's a serious matter. Serious? You call this serious when George is dead? I sympathise with your feelings, sir, but I think I ought to show this to Mr. Garrick. Well, what's it got to do with him? If Payne's a member of the company. I think Mr. Garrick ought to know. Do you really think so? Yes, I do, and I should take it to him straight away. Oh, very well, if you insist, but I think it's a mistake. Much better to burn it and forget all about it. <laughs> Yes, sir, I drink your health. May your eyes and your wit never lose their sparkle. <laughs> Thank you, James. Very nicely put. Mr. Thrale and I rejoice in your company tonight, all of you. Davy, fresh from his triumphs at the theatre. And Samuel and James, the most engaging companions in London. We believe our greatest good fortune is in our friends. That is not a question of fortune, madam. Friendship doesn't happen by chance. It must be made... And being made has to be kept in constant repair. <laughs> oh, come now, David. Say, say, say what you will. The play has an ugly reputation. Accidents, injuries, even fatalities have happened over and over again. Could it not be that mishaps attract our attention only when they occur in Macbeth? But when they happen in other plays, nobody knows I doubt it, right. ma'am. I very much doubt it. To prove your hypothesis, I should want a list of all the mishaps in every oh. play performed in London during the past five years. <laughs> if Macbeth then showed a preponderance out of all proportion to the rest, I'd be inclined to agree with you. Surely, uh, David, if you believe in good or ill luck... You admit to being a fatalist. Oh, would you deny the existence of free will? Nay, nay, Henry, I've no opinion about that. But actors are superstitious folk. They live on their nerves. For instance, I give a surpassing performance on one night. Every night, no, David. No, 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 no. Henry, this is my point. One night, I excel. And the next night, exactly the same performance, mm -hmm. I fail completely. <sighs> now, why, I ask. Then I think back, and I remember. I whistled in the green room, or I broke a mirror. Oh. Somehow, I've offended the fates oh. that rule the theatre. Oh, this, sir, is sheer pagan superstition. Every effect has its cause. We must attribute these events to some human agency. To believe otherwise is to court disaster. Well, uh, how can that be? Why, the moment Davy fears ill luck, he becomes vulnerable. Sammy. He walks on stage expecting some catastrophe, almost willing it to happen. But you'll admit that accidents do occur. Not by all means, sir. And you'll not deny that Warburton's death was accidental. Uh, as to that, sir, I'll not commit myself to an opinion. Ah. But, Johnson, you said last uh, night... Sir, we have our suspicions. You, Davy, and I, we have our suspicions. But that does not mean that we know. Well, we're not the only ones to suspect. The rumor goes around the coffee houses that it was murder. Warburton was very unpopular. If we're to murder everyone that's unpopular, London would be another Golgotha. A rumor won't do, Borsi. We need certainty. Hmm. Well, I assume we can discount Rafferty for one. He was unconscious with drink. He only appeared to be unconscious, Buzzy. If he'd been sober, you must agree that he had the opportunity. Aye, Johnson, but not the motive. Not the motive. Don't forget, opportunity and motive. That's what you said. Admirably reasoned, Buzzy. Very well. We agree to exculpate Rafferty. As for Barry, he had motive enough, but no opportunity. I, uh... Uh, I, I, I took your advice, Johnson. I studied the play. Uh, and what did you find? Why, the Barry was on the stage at the end of the previous scene and again at the start of the succeeding one. He couldn't possibly have crossed the stage in time to disguise himself and enter with the other murderers. Yeah, so we assume that Rafferty and Sprenger Barry are above suspicion. Uh, you've been very silent, Davy. What do you think? Do you still say it was a mischance? No, I don't. I believe it was murder. And I believe I know the guilty man's identity. Oh, Indeed. Oh, hey, man, who was it? Forbes 
brought me a paper just before I left. He found it in Warburton's pocket. It was a promissory note for £36. Signed by Jeremy Payne. Payne? Yes, it was Payne. He'd lost money to Warburton at cards. He couldn't pay. He was frightened at what George could do to him. Well, there's your murder, Johnson. The gentleman doesn't come on stage until the banquet scene. Motive and opportunity. Don't you agree, Davy? Aye, Bozzy. I'm afraid I do agree. Well, what will you do, Davy? Do? Well, I must have a talk with Mr. Payne in the morning. I assure you, Mr. Garrick, I had every intention of paying Warburton. The road to hell, Mr. Payne, is notoriously paved with good intentions. But you must believe me. I don't mind admitting to you, sir, that I was frightened of him. He was a dangerous man to cross. He threatened to send his bully boys to call on me. Oh, did he? It looks to me, Mr. Payne, as if Warburton's death came at an opportune moment for you. <laughs> I'll not deny, sir. Why, what do you mean? Do you accuse me? I of... make no accusations, Mr. Payne, yet. But you must admit that you stood to gain by his death. Why, that's a monstrous implication. I I'd never do such a thing. You must believe me. Mr. Payne, I don't know what to believe. But you must understand that you'll be obliged to give a very exact account of your movements on Thursday night. I'm fully prepared to do that, I'm sir. glad to hear it. You'll note, sir, that Mr. Blunt is still alive. I should hope so. What of it? I, I gave him a note as well. What? You owed him money, too? Why, yes. Didn't he tell you? How much? The same amount. Thirty-six pounds. Oh, really, Mr. Payne? How did you come to lose such sums? They both offered me double or quits on different terms of the last three cards and in the box. And took the wager? Well, yes, it was two to one in my favour. Mr. Payne, your innocence appalls me. You have much to learn. Not only about acting. But about cards. I cannot believe that anyone would be so... so gullible. You fell among thieves, Mr. Payne. What is it? It's the officer of the watch, sir. He'd like a word with you. Mr. Garrick, you're not having me arrested. Oh, Gad's life, no, sir. That may come later, not now. Haven't I got enough to plague me this morning? All right, Forbes. Show him in. Uh, yes, sir. And you, Mr. Payne... Wait in the green room. Y yes, sir. I want to know more about your game of faro. We have a statement here, Mr. Garrick, made by one Seamus Rafferty, currently lodged in the roundhouse. Now, you're his employer, I believe. That is correct. Well, Rafferty's admitted to stealing certain sums of money, itemised below, from the box office of the Theatre Royal Drury Lane between the dates 5th and 18th April of this year, 1776. Now, this admission has been written down at his... Dictation, signed by him and witnessed by the magistrate at number six, Bow Street. I understand. Well, now, sir, were you aware that these thefts had taken place? I really don't see that it's any affair of yours, sir. Your, pardon me, sir, but it is. You see, if you knew about these thefts and didn't report them to the magistrate, then you've compounded a felony. I am not making any statement to you, officer, without consulting my attorney. Well, Rafferty says you knew what he'd done. And you made up the loss out of your own pocket and told him to keep his mouth shut. If the loss was made good, mind you, I'm not admitting anything, but if the loss was made good, then where's the felony? I'm not making any charges. Ah, oh, well. You see, sir, there's something else. Rafferty says that this Mr. Warburton got to know. <coughs> Who's there? <coughs> Who is it? <coughs> Who is it? <coughs> Why, Meg. Meg Blunt, what are you doing alone in the green room at this time in the morning? <laughs> what is it, dear? What's the matter? Oh, it's nothing. It's nothing, Sarah. Oh, please, Meg, please tell me. Are you sick? No, it's nothing. Leave me alone, please. Oh, come on, dear. Dry your eyes. Tell me what it is. I can't. I can't. You must. Tell me. Tell Sarah. Is it Thomas? Or have you had another call? Tell me. Tell Sarah. I can't. I daren't. Let me help. There's nothing you can do. How do you know? Nobody can help. Oh, trust me, Meg. Please trust me. I can't. It's only put you in danger, too. 
Danger? What danger? Oh, please go away. Please leave me alone. Well, you needn't worry about me. I can look after myself. Meg, you must tell me. He won't understand. How can I if you won't tell me what it is? Come on, dear. You must share the burden. So to where to start? You have just heard part two of Dr. Johnson Investigates, written by Richard Brayshaw, Leo McKern in the title role, Edward D'Souza as James Boswell. Dr. Johnson Investigates. The year is 1776. The action taking place is in David Garrett's theater company at Drury Lane. The mystery of who killed the actor Warburton has everybody running scared. Dr. Samuel Johnson and his sidekick, James Boswell were present at the scene of the crime. It happened during a performance of Macbeth. Warburton was playing Banquo when he was stabbed to death. Warburton, as it turns out, was not only an actor, but a card cheat and a blackmailer. So there were many motives for murder. However, the list of suspects is even longer. Leo McKern stars as Dr. Samuel Johnson. Good morning, Bozzy. Good morning, my friend. Well, there, move the volumes off that chair, Bozzy. Be seated, be seated. I've got great news, Johnson. The oh. mystery is solved. It was Rafferty after all. Oh, oh, indeed, sir. I thought we'd absolved him for lack of motive. Ah, but he had a motive. Oh. Mr. Dis, the officer of the watch has been talking with Davy. Rafferty's confessed to stealing money from the box office earlier this year. Yeah. Davy wanted the matter kept secret, but Warburton found out and was blackmailing Rafferty, threatened to report him to the justices. Rafferty admits he was getting desperate. He was losing half his weekly pay by extortion. Yes, but has he admitted to the murder? Uh, why, no, not yet, but it's a bit obvious. He had motive and opportunity. He had only to sham drunkenness. Well, anyone can do that. And after all, he's had plenty of practice. Oh, it's, uh, it's Rafferty, without a doubt. Mm. Bozzy, let us examine this business critically and objectively. Now, firstly, let us dispose of fatalism. It is an hypocrisy of misery. What has this affair to do with liberty and necessity? Accidents happen in Macbeth, but in other plays, too. <laughs> Do you suppose that Warburton would be alive now if he'd been appearing in Hamlet? No, no sir, of course not. No, very well. Now, consider the play. Duncan is murdered. The regicide seeks to conceal his guilt by placing suspicion on drunken servants. Mm -hmm. He then has Banquo assassinated. And here we come to the mystery of the third murderer. Well, what's so mysterious about him? Why, sir, he shouldn't be there at all. See for yourself. Well, ah, there. Here's a copy of the play. There, now read me the opening lines of Act 3, Scene 3. Uh, Act uh, 3, Scene 1, Scene 2, three, yes. Uh, enter three murderers. Mm -hmm. uh, first murderer, but who did bid thee join with us? Third murderer, Macbeth. Second murderer, he needs not our mistrust, since he delivers our offices and uh, what we have to do to the direction just. Macbeth has already planned a deed with the first two villains. They do not expect a third accomplice and a surprise when he appears. Well, you're right, Johnson. I, I never realized that. Before. So, despite careful preparation, a third murderer joins the other two ruffians. And someone extinguishes the torch enabling Theons to escape and the witch's prophecy to be fulfilled. Ah, very suspicious circumstances. <laughs> it is indeed. Oh, the critics have wrangled endlessly about the identity of the third murderer. Some say it was Macbeth himself, come to see that the task was faithfully accomplished. Others claim it was one of the witches, sent to ensure failure. Ah, uh, very well, Johnson. I grant you have a very pretty conundrum here, but uh, what does it do with the tragedy of Thursday night? Why, sir... Anyone familiar with the play knows that this obscurity could conceal the identity of a real murderer. 
But what about those playing the other parts? Oh, we'll inquire of Davy. I think we shall find that the minor characters are enacted by such stage hands as were available. Uh, if so, the parts may be taken by different men on different nights. Exactly. So, Bobby, we have a play that is notoriously unlucky. It contains a murderer whose identity is cloaked even to his colleagues. And the chief protagonist diverts suspicion from himself by means of a drugged posset and a bloodstained dagger. Ah, these facts would weigh powerfully with anyone who held George Warburton in hatred or fear. They would indeed. And we know of at least three men who had a motive for murdering him. May not others in the company harbor such a grudge in secret? Delve into the innermost heart of every man, Bozzy. I ask you, how many would you find uncontaminated by the innate proclivity of Cain? Well, that is a very disturbing thought, sir. It means, moreover, that we must revert to suspecting the entire company. <laughs> it does indeed, Bozzy. Let us visit Davy and subject Forbes' report to further scrutiny. Then, logic to thy work, take thou what course thou wilt. Oh, it's a common enough practice, Johnson. Fewer walking gentlemen I have to pay, the better I'm pleased. Ah. The stage assistants carry spears, take small parts, and join in crowd scenes. Now, do they interchange parts? How do you mean, Bozzy? Uh, well, uh, could a third murderer be played one night by John Doe and the next night by uh, Richard Rowe? Oh, yes, indeed. I see. Now, for the evidence. Now, what briefly is the disposition of the premises behind the scenes, David? Uh, well, sir, above the stage is the fly loft. At stage level on the OP side... Uh, the OP, that's uh, opposite prompt. Correct. Mm -hmm. The audience is left side. On the OP side, there are the wings, and behind them, the green room and the scenery store. Well, on the other side... Uh, the, the prompt side. Uh, where else? Uh, the yeah, dressing yeah. rooms and this room are on the first floor. At stage level, the wings, property room... Uh, and, the, uh, and the wardrobe room. And the wardrobe room. room. Oh, okay. These are entered from the corridor running from the prompt corner to the stage door. Uh, but there's also a way from the wardrobe to the stage via the property room. Uh, Mrs. Binion directed. So she did, was he? Now, according to Forbes' report, Haggard, Crane and Edwards confirm each other's presence in the fly loft. In the first floor dressing rooms, Jeremy Payne. Does anyone corroborate that? No, Bozzy. At stage level, Binny and Blunt were in the wardrobe room. Backstage, we have Rafferty, unconscious under the staircase. Opposite prompt, Barry, Mrs. Dancer, the stagehand, and the players for the banquet scene. Now, these are all vouched for. Ah. On the prompt side, visible to the others, it was Mrs. Siddons. On stage were Warburton, John, Nathaniel, and the murderer. In the green room, their testimonies agree with the rest of the company. And Forbes was underneath the stage. And you, Davy, here in your room? Yes. You have only my word for that. So, you're a possible suspect. Oh, possible, Bozzy, but improbable. Oh, thank you, Johnson, for your improbability. So, apart from Davy, the only ones whose testimony is unsupported by others are Rafferty, Payne, and Forbes. Well, I tell you, it must have been Rafferty. Do you agree, Davy? No. I still think it was pain. You have reasons? Proof? Reasons, but no proof. Which could apply equally to Rafferty. Agreed. What is your judgment? My judgment, sir, is not yet formulated. I have, I confess, a strong suspicion amounting almost to certainty. But I have yet to make comprobation. Oh, I have well, to say, come on, man. man. Well, tell us which of these three incur your suspicion. No, sir. Why not? Your question, sir, does not admit of an answer. I suspect none. Oh, for heaven's sake, you say you just said. And for good, good reason. Consider this. Hmm. No man with the ingenuity to plan this assassination would omit to fabricate an appearance of innocence. 
he would be at pains to establish the fact that he was elsewhere when the enormity was perpetrated. But surely the, the converse does not prove his innocence. No, by no means, but we may presuppose a strong probability in this case. Now, thus far will I be categorical with you. Our quarry is one whose movements are apparently accounted for. But he has made one mistake. Murder will out. Now, my suspect committed one error, made one statement unsubstantiated by the facts. Re-examine Forbes' report. Then let us consider how we may exclude a confession from the wretch, for we shall never prove his culpability save from his own lips. Come in. Forgive my intrusion, Mr. Garrick, but Mrs. Blunt has disappeared. Oh. Uh, she's nowhere to be found. Uh, she's due on stage and so Oh, you... the devil. Have you searched the theatre? Oh, yes, I've looked everywhere. Mr. Blunt's distracted. Well, send him to me, please. And you'd better ask Mrs. Metcalf to take the oh. part. Yes, sir. Oh, another confounded misfortune. Will the line stretch out to the crack of doom? Poor Davy. When sorrows come, they come not single spies within oh, battalions. Indeed, indeed. Say so that again. Go on. What, what do you mean? Well, go on. Repeat what you just said. Uh, when sorrows come, they come not single spies, but in battalions. And where does the emphasis fall, sir? What? Oh, oh I, I see. Um, well, I suppose on single. Exactly. Uh, they, they come not single spies. Exactly. These misfortunes are not single or disjunct. They are interconnected. Why has Meg Blunt disappeared? Oh, really, Johnson, how should I know? She, uh, she, may, uh, she may have fallen out with her husband. David? Well, I don't know. She may have been unhappy. She had a furious quarrel with the wardrobe mistress. Why? Well, on some trivial matter, she said her costume wouldn't fit. Exactly. Her costume wouldn't fit. What of it, sir? Why wouldn't it fit? Well, how can I tell? The woman is pregnant, sir. Pregnant? <laughs> That's impossible. Why? Because her husband is impotent. Ha! Huh? Is no other man capable of making her pregnant? Merciful heavens, Johnson, you don't... And suggest. if she is pregnant by another man, how can she face her husband? She's probably gone in search of an abortionist. Mr. Garrick, sir, you must help no, me. I'm desperate. No. My wife Calm has disappeared. yourself, Mr. Blunt. We shall do all we can to find your wife. But she's left without a trace. No note, no message. She's never done this before. Have you informed the watch? Well, I... Oh, excuse me interrupting, sir. Oh, not sir. now, Binny, if you please. I'll attend to you later. It's urgent, sir. Very urgent. I've a note for Mr. Boswell from oh. Mrs. Sidney. Oh, uh, uh, thank you, Mrs. Binny. Well, well she said to give it to him straight away. Well... Why? It's urgent, all right. She says... Uh, yeah. We'll hear it later, Bozzy. Uh, let us first give our minds to Mr. Blatt's predicament. But this may assist us. No, not now, sir. Not here. Really, Johnson? I sir, I what? command you to be silent. Dr. Johnson, sir, I defer willingness to your judgment in most matters, but in this instance, you must allow me to know best. Very well. You know best. Read us your message. Hmm. Uh, dear Mr. Boswell, I must see you immediately after the performance. I know the answer that has eluded us, and I'm very apprehensive. Please come to the green room when the curtain falls. Signed, Sarah Siddons. When did she give you this, Binny? Twenty minutes ago, sir. Been looking for Mr. Boswell all over. Oh, Mr. Forbes told me he was with you. Uh, Mr. Plant, I believe your wife is friendly with Mrs. Siddons. She is, sir. Well, perhaps this will throw some light on her disappearance. Let's hope so. I agree. And with your permission, Mr. Garrick, I'll go and inform the watch. Do so by all means. Why, uh, I hope I did right, Mr. Yes, Garrick. Yes, yes, Benny, you did the right thing. Now, you may go now. Thank you, sir. Uh, no, madam. Wait. Wait just a little. Yes, sir? Yeah. Yes, there's something else. Yes, sir? You said... Mr. Blunt was in the wardrobe room on Thursday night? Oh, that's right, sir. For how long? Oh, half an hour, sir. And was it with you all the time? Oh, yes, sir. Well, you meant to discuss you. That's right. Why didn't he leave his cloak with you? Uh, oh, it wasn't just his cloak, sir. He ripped the skirt of his coat and his breeches, too. His breeches were torn? Oh, yes, sir. Horrible tear. It's a wonder he didn't do himself a nasty injury. Madam, did he divest himself of his nether garments and stand before you in a state of nudity? If you mean, did he take off his breeches in front of me? Well, certainly not, sir. I'll not have goings-on of that sort. 
It's like Covent Garden, you know. We're a respectable theatre. Yes. He went behind the screen like they all do. Yes. And how long, madam, was he concealed by the screen? Well, all the time. He goes behind the screen, throws his britches over the top, then he sits down and studies his lines for the next... Can day. you assure me that he studied lines for half an hour behind the screen? Can you be certain that he didn't steal through the other door to the property room and the stage? Can you be categorical about this, madam? Why, uh, well, uh, uh, no, sir, I, I can't say. No, and can we be certain that Blunt is now in search of his wife? Or does he seek to prevent Mrs. Siddons giving us the information promised in her note? Say, God, why did I read the note? The trap! Oh, Bozzy, the trap! Uh, Mrs. Siddons mustn't use that trap! Good God, Go no. on with you, you and Davy. Yes. Go below stage as fast okay, as you can. Wait. Hurry this other moment to lose. Listen, Bozzy. Yes, this way, Bozzy. Mind your head. Mrs. Siddons! Mrs. Siddons! Mrs. Siddons, are you there? Mr. Garrick and Mr. Boswell! Oh, thank heaven you're safe. Stand off the platform at once! Madam, get off that platform immediately! Hera, quick! The lantern, Bossy! Give me the lantern, there's somebody there! Hotham Davy, he's climbing the ladder! What's happening? I'll explain later. Are you all right, Sarah? Yes, I'm all right, Mr. Boswell. Oh. The trap door. It's so sad. I might have been killed. You're safe now. Never mind about your entrance. Come, we must join the others. Hold my hand. This way. Mortal custom. Yet my heart throbs to no one thing. Did you see him, Holmes? Who's that? Why, Blunt, of course. Yes, he ran past me down the corridor. Ring down the curtain. What? The curtain? Have it down at once. Oh, very well, sir. And then send for the watch. Tell him to come to the stage door. Quickly, man. Yes. I will be satisfied. Deny me this, and an eternal curse fall on you. Let me know. What the devil's going on? No, sir, not an apparition. I now the curtain down in the middle of I'm stopping the performance, Barry. No time to explain. Go before the curtain and apologize. Say what you like, but clear the theater. Now make haste. We have a madman at large. <laughs> And I have the key. Dr. Johnson, what are you doing here? Sir, your crime is discovered. What the devil are you talking about? Thomas Blunt, I charge you with the murder of George Warburton. You must be demented, sir. <laughs> Come, give me the key. I'm in great haste. There's no escape, sir. The watch have been summoned. This is madness. Why should I kill my best friend? Because you discovered his affair with your wife. That's preposterous, sir. Even if that were true, I was in the wardrobe room when George was stabbed. No, sir, you were not. But you were at pains to make it appear so. While Mrs. Binion believed you were concealed behind the screen, you stole into the property room, assumed Rafferty's cloak, <laughs> and committed the murder. <laughs> Farrago of nonsense. Everyone knows it was Rafferty. Rafferty was rendered insensible by the drug you surreptitiously administered to him. You laid your plans with great cunning, sir. But you committed one error. Indeed, sir. Pray, what was that? Your pretext for gaining Mrs. Binion's unwitting collusion. I subjected the scenery and especially the archway to meticulous scrutiny. I discovered no projection or excrescence which could possibly have damaged your garments. And this fact was confirmed independently by Mr. Forbes. From this, I infer that you deliberately tore your clothing. Now, please, to be ingenious, sir. I haven't time to argue. Perhaps this will persuade you to change your mind. Give me the key. That weapon, sir, confirms your guilt. You may have suspicion, sir, but no proof. You yourself have supplied it. You are holding it at my head. Aye, sir. And I'll blow your brains out unless you give me the key. Come, sir. Give me your weapon. 
and submit to justice. I won't. I can't. Stand back. Stand away or I fire. Jonathan! Jonathan! Are you there? No, don't come any further, Davy. Stay where you are, all of you. He's armed with a pistol. Letters, goats, and monkeys. Come, sir, surrender yourself. I beg you. Never, never. Better be with the dead, whom we, to gain our peace, have sent to peace, than on the torture of the mind to lie in restless ecstasy. No, no. Samuel. Samuel, are you safe? Are you unhurt? Oh, yes. Davy, I am unhurt. I'm shaken, God knows, but unhurt. Oh, thank heavens for that. I feared for your life. He was desperate. Once a man has resolved to kill himself, he has nothing to fear. Is Mrs. Siddon safe? Aye, we got there just in time. Ah. Blunt had prized the hinges off the trap door. It was held in place by the bolt alone. When that was drawn, the whole thing descended. Her death would have been certain had we delayed. I brought the curtain down, and Barry is making my apologies. Uh, I think, baby, a, a modest libation of your brandy would restore my equanimity. Uh, of course, Johnson. Of course. Go to my room and help yourself. I'll fetch Fozzie and Mrs. Siddons. There, there, my dear. It's all over now. You're quite safe. I knew something was going to happen. That horrible trap door. I felt sure there was someone else down there, but it was dark. I couldn't see. I'm so frightened. Ah, come along, my poor child. Dry your eyes. No one's going to harm you now. We'll look after you. Oh, you don't know how glad I was to see you. How brave you were. And you came just in time. How did you know? You did know, didn't you? You knew it was blunt. Yes, Sarah, I knew. By a process of logic, inexorable logic, and careful deduction. And Dr. Johnson, he knew too, didn't he? Uh, why, yes, he showed remarkable acumen in following my reasoning. Why, here we have it. We know that several of the company wished Warburton dead. He was an unsavory character, a bully and an extortioner. Such a man would not scruple to cuckold his best friend. Now, uh, when it appeared that his wife had a guilty secret, I remembered Blunt's reputation for insane jealousy. Well, how he came to suspect her unfaithfulness, I know not. I do, Dr. Johnson. Huh? Warburton and Blunt were playing cards with Jemmy Payne. George paid Tom a sovereign. It was a keepsake that Tom gave Meg when they were married. It had a small hole in it with a motto. Yeah. Meg said she lost it, but Tom didn't believe her. She was frightened of him. Oh, she had good reason. He was a dangerous man. Oh, when he realized you knew his secret, he sought the opportunity to silence you. And chance gave it to him. Oh, so you admit, sir, that chance had a hand in this affair. Chance has a hand in all our affairs. <laughs> what signifies is how the human will responds to the vicissitudes of fortune. Do you recall, sir, how only a few nights ago you postulated that art must imitate nature? Aye, Bozzy, but in this sad business, nature has imitated art with a vengeance. Dear Mr. Boswell, dear Dr. Johnson, it's very late. I shall say good night. Oh, yes. Thank you again for saving my life. I shall be forever beholden to you. Your most devoted servant, Sarah. May you have success and acclaim in your new engagement. Thank you, sir. Good night, my dear. You have shown great courage. And fortitude. I wish Drury Lane had dealt more gently with you. Thank you, Mr. Garrick. You've been very kind. <laughs> Dr. Johnson, I can never repay the debt I owe you. May I be permitted to kiss you? Oh, by all <laughs> means, my dear. <laughs> ah. <laughs> the debt is now paid in full, ma'am. Indeed, there is a handsome surplus, uh, which will provide me with an annuity for the rest of my days. 
Good night. <laughs> Good night. Good night, my dear. Ah, charming, charming. Well, now, Bossy, it's nearly two o'clock in the morning. Davy still has his accounts to do. Oh. I shall go home, if not to bed, then to finish ordering my books. Well, we bid you good night, Davy. Good night, Joseph. Come, Bossy, come. Good night, Bossy. Good night, Davy. Why, uh, why, no, sir, no. Well, what, then, is the cause of your preoccupation? Uh, oh, uh, I perceive, sir, that uh, you do not appear to be wholly impervious to the attractions of Sarah Siddons. Ah. <laughs> I am an old man, sir, and must be grateful. <laughs> I own I was much affected by her charming salutation. Ah, she might have bestowed a similar favor upon me. Why, Bozzy, can it be that you're jealous? Well, uh, sir, I, I, I fancy I was to some degree instrumental in her deliverance. Oh, so you were, Bozzy, so you were indeed, had it not been for your timely intervention. Mrs. Simmons might well have perished. Ah, just so, sir, just so. Why, sir, future playgoers will refer to Mrs. Simmons as the actress whose life was preserved by James Boswell, heir apparent to the Laird of Affleck. Bachelor of Laws and Man of Letters. Do you really think so? I'm certain. Uh, Sarah Siddons and the Laird of Affleck. <laughs> uh, uh, sir, one thing puzzles me. Uh, well, a triviality. Well, what is it? When Blunt emerged from the wardrobe room half clad, did he not risk conspicuity? <laughs> Even in these degenerate days, a man deprived of his breeches invites attention. Ah, why, sir, may not a man wear two pairs of breeches as easily as one? Check and a presentation of Dr. Johnson Investigates by Richard Brayshaw. Leo McKern played the title role, and Edward D'Souza was James Boswell.